Hello, good evening everybody. Welcome. Bring yourselves round the fire. Today I have something which I think is, to me, it's one of, like, it's just a gem. It's a treasure that we're going to explore. Building off Richard Wagner Day, we're going to be looking at an artist, a Scottish artist who is unfortunately not very well known, but I think after the stream you will see there is real richness and beauty and just great value in his artwork. Uh, we are going to be looking at the paintings of John Duncan. And to help me do that, I have the wonderful, the indigifafatigable Ferro. Hello, sir. How are you doing? Good evening. Welcome. And um, thank you so much for having you on. All the way around. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, well, I, was thank thinking, I was thanking I was thanking you for having... Yeah, there we go. Anyway. <laughs> uh, well, it's a, it's a pleasure to have you on. Thank you for joining. Um, Thank you. This is something we've been kind of talking about for a few months, uh, ever since we did Ruskin and Morris. Uh, could you say a little bit about why D Duncan is is somebody that you find is important to talk about? So, so okay, my, my relationship with Duncan dates back to 15 years ago, where um, I am, as my wife, my wife will uh, testify to a notorious book fiend. And I, I, I love a bargain and I love an Oxfam books. So for, for our American listeners, there are charity shops devoted purely to books. And I must say that the, the quality of these is often excellent. And I was living in um, Kentish Town at the time, which is kind of like um, near, near Islington. It's this kind of posh North London area. I was not living in a posh uh, <laughs> apartment, I'd like to say. But um, the Oxfam books in Kentish Town had some of the, it still does have has the best art books in the whole in the whole of London, and um, some of our activities on uh, on a Saturday as two kind of poor twenty somethings would be to kind of check out check out the the bookstore and have have a dive through, and I found this um, beautiful blue book called um, The Symbolists. It was made in the seventies. And it was a kind of a summary of uh, this rough group of artists called um, the Symbolist. Now, I had, I had never heard uh, that kind of word being used from an artistic perspective before. I, I got to say that my, my background, strictly speaking, isn't I didn't do like art history or art at university or anything like that at all. Um, so everything I picked up was from um, like self learning and also like a lot of BBC. Like I was. A, a, like a, a, fee, a fiend for, for like documentaries and all that kind of stuff. BBC um, Four was the place to be, I guess. It, 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 I'm telling you again. It was like I was actually reminiscing about like the golden age of BB, <laughs> BBC. But, you know, from from 2000 to 2010 had some great quality content. They were they were producing banger after banger of good quality art content, and, and I learned a huge amount. But during that entire time, you know, hundreds of hours watched, never heard about these guys beforehand. So yeah. I look, I look into the book, and it's it's this kind of weird collection of uh, artists spread across the globe. Uh, you know, you've got uh, maybe a couple of pictures from Burne Jones. You know, he'll he'll be the most well known um, artist in there. You've got um, Ferdinand Knopf, and again, like his paintings immediately kind of jump out to you. Um, they're so kind of freakish but beautiful at the same time, um, you know, Gustav Moreau, uh, et cetera. And one of the pages was uh, devoted to John Duncan. He got one He got one picture. He got St. Bride in there. <laughs> I mean, that's uh, a good um, picture to get in. I, I mean, yeah, exactly. Uh, and, again, it just it leapt out at me. You know, it, mm. it really stuck in, my, stuck in my head. So, anyway, I forget about it for, for a couple of years, and then I kind of start – the YouTube channel eventually, and I wanted to do a series on the symbolists, uh, kind of going back to this book book that I got, and um, I was like, oh, you know what I should do? I should like choose the best artist from there and do a bit of personal research on it, and then um, that's when I kind of dug into John Duncan. Now, I have I, I, you sort of alluded to this a little bit at the start, Nathan, but I genuinely believe that John Duncan is um, Scotland's greatest artist. I'm I'm a hundred percent behind. I'm I'm genuinely serious. Genuinely serious. I'm not saying this because mm -hmm. I'm a big a big fan of his. I think in terms of the quality of the work, in terms of the breadth, the depth, um, it is actually maybe one of the greatest crimes of the current artistic landscape 
that he has been totally forgotten. Um, for example, if you were just to just do a Google, do a Google, do a Google, do a Google search <laughs> of um, Scotland's greatest artists. I, I, let me just let me just do this now. Uh, this is live let's, research. Let's live. You've, got, you've got Macintosh on on there, for example. I mean, mm -hmm. I love Macintosh. He is not an artist, you know what I'm saying. He does a few bit, little design bit. He's an architect, anyway. I mean, um, yeah, like David Wilkie's pretty good. And then, like, who else is there really? You've got like a couple of like romantic, like there's a bit of neoclassical elements to it at all. But Duncan is not on there. I, it, it, it's it's so weird that he's not been picked up. I'm almost kind of conspiratorial about it. Kind of like. Why have they kept him down all this time? Mm. I would also like to say that um, he's not allowed to get big until I've bought one of his paintings. <laughs> I, have to say, I was very close to doing it, Nathan. I was very close. I, like that one, really? of them, one of them went... Okay, okay. Like, How much do you think one of his paintings go for? I mean, I, I have no idea about art prices. Okay, okay. I mean, we're talking like a, mi a million pounds for an impressionist, for example. Like okay. for, for, for a Monet, for example, you know. Based on that, how much how much do you think he he would cost? I mean, I I, I know what I would value him, but I would say let, let's just say a uh, couple of hundred thousand. Twenty thousand pounds it eventually sold for. It's ridiculously 20, ridiculously like yeah, a ridiculously low price. I almost convinced the wife that we didn't need to buy a car and that we should have bought a painting instead, but she didn't quite go for it. But he's not—he's he, not allowed to get big until I've—I finally saved up enough for it for it, for one of his paintings. But it, it's—it's literally um, insane. And um, I, I did this kind of similar stream. I had a couple of paintings on um, on him, but like uh, over time, I, I've kind of come back to um, his work over and over again. And he's—he's he's just such an interesting guy. His entire life story is just one of just pure like Scottish tragedy as well, like yeah. this. Um, this kind of beauty and vision and vigor and sadness and decline and destruction at the same time. Um, so, yeah, I, really, I guess, really poignant. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I guess just to tie into kind of what you were saying, how I, I came across Duncan was, you know, I, I do a lot of kind of research into mythology and legends, and I often post paintings based upon these stories on Twitter or whatever. And a lot of that's going to be pre-Raphaelite. Um, you know, they do a lot of Arthurian uh, cycle stuff and so on. But then I come across uh, Duncan's Tristan and Isolde. Uh, and it was just so different, but it still had that kind of beautiful sincerity, which the, the PRB have with their work. But it, it just has a very different feel to it. And it was very moving. And then in time you know being fortunate enough to live close to edinburgh i was able to go up to the the art gallery and see for myself um some of the paintings and you know you're in this place where there's lots of fantastic work um but that just jumped out at me uh saint bride uh which we'll come to i'm sure just jumped out at me and i was just standing there just mesmerized for a long time and so ever since I've, I've I've wanted to kind of share that with with somebody else. I'm glad somebody else appreciates him so much. Yeah, I, I mean, this is where we start right now. The, yeah. the Duncan Appreciation Society is my vision that one day we will get the John Duncan Museum where we get all of his works together in Scotland, in in oh. Edinburgh, in his old studio. It has to it has to happen. It's, it's genuinely criminal um that scotland's greatest son has been forgotten and um that's that, that's it that's it. the worst thing is he's not even like hated you know he's mm. just totally just totally forgotten it's such a weird it's such a weird situation he he's a man who lived outside of time in in many ways as as well yeah. um and just through happenstance i i think he just had a series of messed up opportunities which we'll go into in a bit but it was partly the wrong time it was partly um, his character, as we'll talk about, and and his, but also kind of like the patronage network. Loads of things just horribly went wrong in his life. Yet he manages to create a substantial run of very good quality paintings. Um, and, and again, when you like what when you think about like what makes a good artist, I want you to not think about an individual painting. But f for me, I think a good artist uh, has breadth. He has um, longevity, um, 
and he has he doesn't just stick to one work and hopefully we'll, we'll kind of see that actually there is a huge amount of depth in his in his work as well which is in my opinion what makes him so great well with that should we get into your you you've sent me a number of pictures so i'll i'll try and share uh, the kind of um base page and then we can take it from there yeah i've spared everyone the the usual powerpoint slides this time for for some um some images now before we go into a little bit about his life i, I mean one thing I, one thing i will say is that he's um just a kind of um like center us a little bit he's born in 1866 to uh, he's the son of a grocer and a power loom weaver and again i just i just i just love that because you know just out of such humble um mm. humble birth he um kind of blossoms like this beautiful uh beautiful flower um but you know he doesn't have any of my privilege my privilege um but like there's there's a genuine point to that it's like he, he, he like um giberti was the illegitimate son of a goldsmith you know donatello was the son of a goldsmith you know all of many of the great masters had um artistic networks behind them before they even started you know imagine being the son of a grocer and saying yeah dad i'm going to go off and become like the world's greatest mythological uh, tempera painter of all time you know <laughs> he just wants his son to like flog aubergines for a, for a two for a pound you know um so uh, he, he obviously had had these kind of uh, early challenges um and but i'm always brought back to again that it's going to be inevitable there's gonna be a lot of ruskin in this so apologies nathan um don't ruskin, apologize ever for ruskin yeah Ru ruskin talks about um creativity um in a generation and he says that in any generation there's a set amount of creative people that are produced um and you can either f find and use those people or you can discard them. And I think that's a very powerful thing because, again, mm. if, if you if you look at the history of artists, you've got many of these kind of, you know, like humble artists that just come out of nowhere. I'm thinking Turner. You know, he was sketching in his father's barber shop. Um, I think even R Reynolds as well. You know, another, you know, another hum humble birth. So you, 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 I think you do have these kind of creative families, and it comes from generations. But you do just have these uh, men of brilliance that appear out of nowhere. But the question is, do, as a society, do we find and do we use those people? And John Duncan was not used by Scotland at the time. And we'll, we'll, yeah. uh, we'll, we'll, we'll go into that later. So I, guess, I guess just, just, to, just yeah. to add to that, would you say as well, like in literature, you've got somebody like Robert Burns would be an example of this too, or um, yeah. perhaps William Shakespeare. You know, they don't have that kind of network behind them. Uh, but there's... The, it, I guess like Carlyle talks about like nature bringing forth great men in all of these different disciplines 100%. and so on. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. Um, now, just to kind of give us a bit of context at the time. So if he's born in uh, 1866, this is kind of like, uh, I, you know, born into middle Victorian period, but actually, you know, he, he's, a, he's in his 20s when he's starting to kind of um, have his own ideas in really in the high Victorian period we're talking, so kind of 18, 1880s onwards. So I wanted to say, like, what's going on during this kind of high Victorian period? Now, um, Ruskin, again, gives us a really useful oversight as to the state of art in England in his um, 1774, uh, or was it 77, um, book, uh, The Art of England. And what he does is a series of five lectures talking about what, what he thinks are the kind of major groups of um, like artists that, at the time. Now, obviously, this is, that's a little bit before um, Duncan really kind of comes into his, his full swing. But um, what Ruskin thinks the landscape looks like is um, you've got the realistic school of painting with people like Rossetti, Holman Hunt, the Pre-Raphaelites. You've got the what he describes as the mythic school of painting with Byrne Jones and G.F. Watts. You've got the classic school of painting with um, Leighton and Alma Tadema. And then you've got three like lesser known areas. You've got what he calls fairyland with a series of um, women illustrators. You've got fireside. Uh, he calls the fireside uh, painters with uh, John Tenniel. He did the um, 
Alice in Wonderland illustrations. Oh, You've probably okay, seen that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and then you've got the hillside uh, with um, F- Copley Fielding, which is kind of like p- like high Victorian la- landscapes. So what what I've got here is I've got one example of of each of what I think are the significant schools. And, and can we start off with the realistic? So this is the the one that everyone's going to be most, most familiar with. This is Mapiabi, uh, the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood, but. Uh, like as as much as I think the PRB are, it's it, it's tired sometimes. It's overplayed, but their significance is so fundamental to the nineteenth century. I, th- mm. I, re- I I really think you do you, you do not know how big their impact was on a global st- scale, uh, and how early on as well. So this is this is the first painting. This is from you know the realistic school. Um, you know if if you don't know who the P- PRB are. What, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? But no, for, for those for those who don't know, they're a um, a group of painters that were dedicated to countering, um, I guess, kind of classic like neoclassical forms in painting, and so created uh, wanted they wanted to kind of go back to um, like a high Renaissance just before um, Raphael was born. So kind of think about the fifteenth um, century. Italian painters and I guess part of that was about um, like some of their focuses included uh, medievalism some of their focuses involved um, realism trying to come up with these kind of hyper realistic forms uh, about focusing on nature and the background of a painting you know like um, they're kind of countering romantic painters of of the early uh, 19th century where again everything's like a black melange in the black or mm. brown melange in the background they care about the background you know look at the detail on the top right hand side of the there's like the pot plant has more detail on it than any abstract painter has spent their entire life doing you know um but they're also messing around with things as well so you've got the kind of uh, there's a bit of weird perspective on this painting because um they're, they're kind of playing around with this kind of medieval ideas or like i i, I guess wh- why so- someone like um the kind of high high classical renaissance is beautiful is because you know every you've got these kind of amazing muscled people but there is something lost in that process and that's this is what the prb is trying to come come back with uh and i think i think this kind of sums up um a style that's going to be taken by the entire world and used time and time again so you've got these kind of larger larger canvases um it's a history subject um You've got um, a large cast of characters. Many people are in profile. Can you see most like ev- most almost everyone's in mm. profile, as opposed to kind of head head on or in three quarter. But most importantly, there's none of these kind of um, Renaissance poses. You know, um, I'm very much against contrapposto. This is this is this is a, this will annoy many many artists. I hate contrapposto. <laughs> it's it's such like a such a fake thing. You know, no one, no one in real life contrapostos unless you're like doing a selfie for Instagram or something like that. You know, or d- doing a, like a photo. So, so that there is a kind of like fakeness to mm. all of their kind of like um, to, to classicism at the same time, and that's what the PRB is trying to, trying to kind of strip away. So that that's one one influence that I, I would say there are several waves of the PRB. You've got the initial um, the initial team, which is basically only. Holman Hunt, Millet, and Rossetti, and Rossetti sort of drops off. So it's basically Hunt and Millet, and then Millet drops off. So it's Hunt. Hunt is the PRB, in my my opinion. We should we should have a big debate about this sometime, like a PRB session, because it's a good it's a good chat. But Hunt is the number one, in my opinion. He's always number oh, yes. one. Yeah, he's the um, definitive, I guess. Um, exa- exactly. One um, question I was going to just yeah. have, Ferro, is um, you know you've mentioned Ruskin quite a lot, and it's it seemed like in the nature of the Gothic which if you haven't read folks, go and read it, it's great. He mentions naturalness a lot, and that is both like an emphasis upon nature and reflecting like um, plant life and so on, being a a key part of uh, the Gothic culture, but then also that it reflects what's real and it's not just like the good and not just the bad. Mm. But I wonder in a visual sense, this amount of detail is also kind of conveying that idea that it's it's trying to present... um, Things as they are, rather than an idealized form. Yeah, and and just just on that, a big part of the PRB's 
PRB's idea was to go out to nature to paint. Mm. So you know the Ophelia painting that Millet does, the very famous, uh, yeah. famous one. He did the the background for that. Um, him and Hunt go off on a on a little jaunt to the country, and they literally paint it in situ, plein air, um, and then he goes back and like dump dumps siddle in a bath for Ophelia basically but back home <laughs> but they go to nature and again this is this is a very big thing because um the academics you know the royal the royal academy was very much you would have you would, you would have some life drawing but it was in the studio but you would very much focus on the antique as well so so again like all of the setups that they would do are fake you know that there is this kind of fakery to it while um the PRB is just trying to like hone and channel in that kind of raw naturalness and attention to nature. I mean, re regarding Ruskin and the PRB, I, I mean, Hunt insists that he never like was that influenced by Ruskin. In his in his biography, he does reference the fact that he did read The Nature of Gothic. Um, and it, it just so happens that after The Nature of Gothic, or about roughly the same time, they're kind of producing these kind of paintings. Yeah. Um, like if you zoom in, if you zoom, like, he paints every single leaf on this. It's just the level of the detail is insane. Um, early Millet is just like off the chart. Um, oh. It's kind of like autistic painting in some way because it's just like just just almost too much detail. Um, you, you have to you have to do it in your own time. I think just like um, oh. just try and get a, a high quality uh, picture and just, just just see how spend some time in the background of some of Millet's early paintings. Um, so, but. Let's just say that there was a zeitgeist, you know, there, there was a, a movement in, in the time to focus on nature again. And, and I think that's true of Duncan's work as well. Yeah. Um, keep this in your head because you'll, you'll see you'll see this kind of style, lots of portrait, uh, lots of portraits, uh, sorry, uh, profile um, it, style pictures, very Duncan-esque. Um, oh yeah, so, so in terms of the phases, you've got that kind of initial phase, then you've got like, I would say kind of Burne Jones, and then you've got like um, the kind of arts and crafts and then a few stragglers and like Waterhouse, in my opinion, is like the, the last inheritor of that. And Waterhouse goes, again, quite late up until like the 1910s, 1920s even. People think he's like a Victorian, but he's really not. So, um, oh, you know what, actually, you've been um, posting... You've got to follow Nathan on on Twitter if you've not if you if you haven't already. But you've been doing some really good um, like th third wave PRB posting. Um, mm -hmm. I'm just trying to think of some of the names n n now. It's like uh, is it um, Arthur Davies or something like that? You've got um, Arthur Hughes, Arthur um, Hughes, Arthur and then there's Hacker. Um, John Collier. Yeah, Collier. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. There's basically like three or Frank four. Frank Dixie. Yeah, yeah, Dixie as well. Like he does this yeah. amazing Icarus, for example. Um, mm. I, I would say that, like, that third wave for me is a little bit too. Uh, it's a little bit too lame sometimes. It's kind of it is kind mm. of like your, your um, saccharine, super romantic medievalism. I mean, I I do love it, but at the same time, it's kind of just like, oh, this is just just it's just so idealized at the same time. Well, I, I feel like the first mm. wave PRB is just like there's a rawness to it that I, I really appreciate. But um, they, those guys are often forgotten about as well. We should we need to do an entire PRB stream, obviously, one, one time, you know. But any, anyway, hugely influential for like the next fifty years, basically sixty years, right? Okay, Can we, do, do you mind bringing up the, the mythic school next, if that's all right? Now, R Ruskin basically identifies the symbolists even before the symbolists happen, um, and in, in many ways, I sort of prefer Ruskin's myth, use of the word mythic. The symbolist actually comes out of a French term from uh, Baudelaire's style of poetry in the 70s. And yeah. I hate it. I, I hate it because, number one, it's French. And then number two, um, it's confusing between the kind of poetic and the artistic elements because there is no crossover. I mean, I've investigated, I've investigated it in depth and I can't see any intellectual crossover between uh, Baudelaire's work and the symbolist art. So I'm going to call it mythic as Rus Ruskin does but essentially um f from like 75 onwards there is this huge wave of um uh, spiritualism um I, I guess kind of like maybe even occultism dare I say mm -hmm. um we do we, okay we, we you do not know how much Darwin messed up 
the elite at the time like we just we can't understand what it's like in the 1850s everyone is a christian and in the 1870s people are doing seances they're doing like weird occult stuff it took 20 years for a complete like moralistic decline of the of the ruling class but tied into this is kind of like um a, a look at uh, kind of hidden and darker forms and mm. i guess that yeah the, the two big component uh, proponents of that in the uk are gf watts if you haven't been down to the watts gallery in london you need to go because it's an amazing experience he produced so much amazing quality work and also he's kind of like contemporary to the prb guys but he just like does um he just does his own thing, if that makes sense. He just like um, just churns. No, it's genuinely. He's kind of like a, a lo- mm. he's like an, a lone ranger and just churning out good quality work. But Ben Jones kind of sits between the PRB camp and and the symbolist or the the mythic school, I should say. And this is in in some ways like just a really good representation of this kind of work. This is um, Lancelot reaching the Grail Church. Right, so again, it's a classic, classic um, medieval subject, you know, TR, PRB ticked, but like everything about it has these kind of mythic elements. Like, look at the color palette here. You've got the greens, the yellows. It's this like super tight uh, palette. You've got um, the shield being suspended in the air by a tree. You know, what what does what does that mean? Is it because Lancelot's just put it in there before collapsing on the floor? You've got the mystery of the Grail quest itself, but we don't look, get to look inside the church. All we see is the angel appearing from it and the, and the light. So it's all about um, like questions and symbology and deeper meaning and um, questions we're asking ourselves and trying to tra- tap into um, this kind of more spiritual side at the expense of realism and uh, and reality at the same time. And um, like... Like I said, the, the, this kind of mythic symbolist school, b- because it wasn't a group of people like the PRB was, it never had the same kind of success and it was never recognised as like a cohesive group. So it's done on, you're all, almost like on an individual level, if that makes sense. For mm. example, not, I know that Knopf was heavily featured in many of the art journals of the time, right? He He actually went to England to kind of like show his work to people. But again, he sort of acted like a, a lone ranger in, in many ways. But I'm sure I'm sure that a lot of these guys are um, influencing uh, Duncan. Say, so. would it be um, just just for clarification? Because you mentioned Waterhouse earlier, and as a kind of last PRB, he does a lot of Arthurian based kind of paintings. The subject matter yes. is is mythical. So yeah. why wouldn't he count as a mythic? Uh, Painter in that regard. I, I mean, you, all of these terms, there, there is uh, mm. some fuzziness to it. But where I would say that Burn Jones is always has this kind of mythic edge to it is around the deeper symbolism. Mm. Like if when you're when you're reading a Waterhouse painting, everything is as it is. You know, here's a bunch of nymphs sucker, sucker, suckering in someone across there, or here is the Lady of Shalott. Um, um, you know, was it floating down on the boat, for example? Like, he doesn't include uh, mysterious and intriguing things in his paintings. He also doesn't change his color palette that often. You know, everything is everything is real. He's he's focused in reality. He's anchored in reality. While mm. Burn Jones is, he's like seeing a different plane of reality itself. You know, he's seeing it uh, like an in between land um, that no one else can see. And only he has, there is meaning behind it, but only he knows what it is. And maybe he's putting in some stuff that he doesn't even know. So, same thing with like Nop, for example. Nop is obsessed with like the colors of blue and yellow. If you see all of his works, they're all um, like tied and noted or, around that. Um, if, you, if you just type in, yeah, Ferdinand Nop, um, Cheetah, Cheetah Sphinx. Should be pretty. Oh yeah, let's it. see. Um... Is this the one? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so, so again, it's like it's a really weird painting because, um, 
Like it's it's a depiction of the Sphinx and uh, Odysseus, but it's almost as like lovers or um, you know why why are they hugging in in a in a di- in a different kind of way. Look at the color palette again. It's almost like this it, this is not real. There is a kind of a ridiculous to, to ness to this. Almost like is this is Dada or um, you know surrealism before surrealism existed. Uh, mm. What's what's the significance of the two pillars? What's the significance of the writing in the background? There's all of these like hidden hidden meanings um, that have been added in for a specific purpose. So that that's what that that's how I would demark it. While I feel like Waterhouse is pretty straightforward with the reading, you know, there. I, I mean, I love his work, but there isn't. Um, depth beyond beyond it if that makes sense no i I get that it's almost these paintings are trying to get to the essence of what's being like the essence and the form are combined together exactly whereas a waterhouse is just the surface level story which which is which is really good and and again like Mm -hmm. i I, sometimes it's nice to kind of just have like this is a beautiful rendering of um of a story at the same time so i'm not I mean, I, I obviously lean more to the simpler st- side in the stuff that in the little artistic endeavors that I do. But um, I still I'm a big fan of Waterhouse, even though, again, he's quite poo pooed um, nowadays for being, you know, chocolate box uh, artist or whatever. Yeah. Uh, so the, 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 the third school that's worth talking about is this kind of um, the classic school. Um, interestingly, the PRB was essentially an assault on the academy and um the the popular art of the time you know and interestingly like ruskin is also um he is also assaulting the the uh, artistic um establishment when he when he writes modern painters so and and that's at roughly that's just before the prb launched on the scene so there mm. are these two big blasts against it in the 50s but by the 70s uh, by the time the seventies come come around, the um, um, the the academy has two new champions. They've sort they sort of um, initially the academy just absolutely hate the PRB for the first like ten years, and then like Queen Victoria is like, oh, actually this is pretty cool, and then everyone's like, okay, yeah, Millet, you can come in. You're you're a pretty cool guy. Hunt, you can still stay still like you can be on the borderline or whatever and that's that's it or whatever they sort of grudgingly accept that he's not he's not going anywhere kind of thing that's but, culture but... is downstream from power there I think. <laughs> well exactly yeah do you, like uh do you not underestimate the power of uh victoria um but in in the 70s there that there, there starts to like the academy reacts to the prb if that makes sense they they take in a number of lessons. So, for example, the attention to the de- attention to detail, um, the focus on realism. But what they try and do is to explore um, more of that kind of traditional, from their point of view, um, classical um, themes, basically. So, it, imagine uh, you know how like the PRB is obsessed with uh, the medieval period. Um, this kind of classical school is obsessed with. The Romans, the Greeks, the Egyptians at the same time, and so uh, the the two biggest proponents of this, I would say, are Lord Lord Leighton and Alma Tadema, uh, both most excellent painters. You know, and, and what they're trying to produce are things like these large historical pieces. I mean, these canvases are very big, but in some ways, they they are sort of reacting back to that Millet painting that we saw beforehand in terms of the format, in terms of this kind of um configuration of people i i think and again look at all of the detailing on the flowers etc you know you wouldn't have had this you don't get this in a reynolds painting or in an early academic uh, romantic painting at all so this is pure like the academy takes on the lessons of prb and f- and fights back what what what, what uh, this is actually uh, the discovery of moses by the way so um a b- biblical oh. themes also very popular and I, I love this you can see here there's moses being paraded in his um, uh, woven basket there with the daughter of the pharaoh uh, on a sedan chair. I think it's just a beautiful moment. Um, and again, just like the, the the look in her eyes as she kind of looks down. I mean, this is this is quite late actually, 1904. But um, we we got to like again in in our modern messed up view, we forget that the academy is like the the academy is art. Right, we, we we all think kind of 
the PRB is like that was what was kind of everyone was talking about. And the answer is like, no, they're not. They're talking about these guys, basically. They're talking about whoever Queen Victoria buys, and she's buying straight from the Royal Academy, and she's not buying from from um, the PRB. Interestingly, I think the only reason why the PRB survived was because of um, a new, new patronage networks from the new bourgeois, from like mill owners, the the satanic mill owners. If it wasn't if it wasn't for the Industrial Revolution, you wouldn't have the PRB basically because um, they they they're a rival node of power and pe- uh, pet- patronage yeah. network. Um, anyway, so. so you, you get an idea. There's there's some really amazing paintings, but they tend to be, I would say, um, very based in reality. Although kind of like these, there's a fakeness to it at the same time. Um, in terms of like they're sort of making up like what did Thebes look like in the past or whatever, you know. Mm. Um, but the attention to detail details there, and there's a kind of hist- historicism as well. I was um, going to ask, is there any significance in her hair colour being red and the rest of them don't have that colour? Well, I wondered, could this be Moses' mother? Because, um, of course, she's given the task by the princess yeah. to look after him. And he's quite light compared to their skin colours. I mean, that is a great shout. And you're probably you're probably right, yeah. it's um, it, That is the kind of like detail that Tadema would put in there as well. So I think that's mm. a really good uh, good shout. Um, and and just a, a question, Lord Leighton, is that Edmund Leighton or is that somebody else? Uh, let me just check. Yeah, it is. It is he he becomes a lord? He gets like he's that mainstream. He literally becomes a lord. Like That's imagine awesome. like a yeah. Um, again, another place to go if you haven't been to is Leighton House in London, which is literally his artistic studio, which is turned into a museum. Um, and, and again, you can see tons of his work. And again, it's just uh, amazing, ex- exquisite detail. You know, again, if I were to criticise him, it's everything's at face value. And again, it's yeah. a bit, la- it's a bit larpy. And you end up in a situation where, then, if you if you're familiar with Good- Goodwood, for example, it becomes a little bit of this kind of like um, old man. Kumarat, uh, sorry to be so, so 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 vulgar, but they all end up doing these kind of like um, nymphomaniac mm. Roman um, beauties in in kind of tight dresses. Basically, um, I'll have to find a, like some examples of it. So so it it, it doesn't really last. I I, I think beyond like tw- twenty years. Basically, it's quite dated. But you, I, there is a kind of golden age of this kind of like new academic style. With Leighton and um, today we're at the front of it, but uh, these guys have the least influence, I would say, on Duncan. But it's worth mentioning it as well. Well, certainly one of the things with Duncan is he does use classical themes and stories as well, right? Yeah. So that yeah. so he is departing from the PRB and mythic in in that respect. Yeah, yeah, you're you're right. These guys bring back classicism again in a big way. Mm. Let's just let's just say. Um, Let's do um, the fairy next. And, and again, this is just kind of like to emphasize um, the, the late Victorian and Edwardian habit for like weird, kooky, what someone like Philosophat would, sorry, Philosophat would describe as like uh, woo. You know, like Philosophicat. That's Philosophicat, the there we go, would describe as like woo. You know, this kind of like pseudo spiritual like nonsense basically there's so much of it going on at the same time you know there's a there's there's this fairy obsession and again ruskin literally has an entire fairy based lecture in his art of uh, britain it's mainly focused on like women producing art though which is quite quite entertaining but i've got this kind of rather rather lovely piece from from rackham which is a little bit later i thought it was rackham yeah because he does a lot of the ring cycle uh illustrations i mean again another criminally underrated uh, English artists. Um, but I just wanted to kind of emphasize there is this kind of like playful, play, playful, kooky mythological stuff that I think would be maybe a bit too sentimental to us now. You know, it's mm-hmm. like garden gnomes, fairies in the garden kind of stuff. Um, but it, there, there is this spiritualism thread, which is, which is kind of like outside of Christianity that is happening at this time as well. 
Um, okay, there, there's two other little revival movements that I want to quickly go for. All. I know it's this is literally like all build up, uh, no actual Duncan. Let, let's do. Um, can we do the Celtic revival because I think that's super super important. In the in the nineties, um, there is this movement to reconnect with um, Celtic forms again. So I would describe it as a weird form of kind of Celtic nationalism. It comes out of Wales. It comes out of Scotland. I know there's like whatever McCeltic versus Gaelic in, in the in the past they all called it Celtic. So Scots cannot complain at me. That's just how they called it. Um, interestingly, I would say that one of the greatest proponents of the the, the Celtic revival in England was G. F. Watts's wife, Mrs. Watts, and this is an interior for the Watts Chapel, which is a small chapel near the Watts Gallery. Again, you can visit it at the same time where he does uh, where she does these. This is all done. This is all. Um, stucco work so so kind of 3d plaster work all done by women where you've got elements of prb elements of the kind of mythic but again look at the kind of celtic um uh like knot work above it or the kind of fonts and the writing and if you see the kind of uh outside of the building that there are loads of different celtic elements again i could spend hours mm. talking about that but es essentially um there is this revival movement going on about Celtic identity and um, Britannic for Britannic, you know, even Burne Jones sort of touches on this as well. You know, he has a series on like Brit Britonic and Celtic uh, mythology in, in the, the 90s. Um, so this it's going on from a artistic perspective, but also I, I quite like I, I, I just like this work. So I included it in here. If you if you go to the other Celtic revival piece, um, it got to such a degree that you've got this uh, kind of Celtic revival in homewares as well. And um, Liberty of London, if you're familiar with the department store, produced their own Celtic revival brand called Simbric Silver, which I believe is some kind of Welsh word. So I've no idea, no idea what it actually means. But it's if you, if you see the entire range, again, it's this amazing um, Celtic styles and Celtic like, well, OK, not really Celtic styles because a lot of it's just made up. Um, you, you know what I'm saying? It's the, it's the classic. Yeah. We're kind of we're looking to the past, but we're basically filling in a lot of the gaps. Let's just say ourselves. A lot a lot of people will look at this and say, "Oh, this is Art Nouveau." It's not Art Nouveau. It's totally different, um, both in terms of the, like the way, the structure and the themes, and kind of like where they're coming from. Do not be do not be fooled. Um, but I just want to kind of emphasize, and and it's worth checking out as well. Check out Simbric S Silver from um, from Liberty. Um, so I want to kind of highlight it's a significant movement. It isn't just like one woman in the middle of nowhere doing like a um, a, a building. It's, you know, it's it's decent size, but I, I would say that it was very fleeting. Like you got like 10 years out of it. Um, the, the final influence is interestingly the Byzantine uh, revival. Um, four or five years, I would say. Um, in fact, maybe, maybe a decade towards like the 1890s. There was this new, new Byzantine re revival going on. Interesting, okay, randomly in the kind of as part of the kind of Catholic. Uh, what's the legislation again? Where we allowed Catholics to to be oh, alive? The Toleration Act. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. It's sort of tied into this. This is um, Westminster Cathedral. So this is the the London Cathedral mm. for the Catholics. Why? Did the Catholics decide to do a Byzantine building? That's the, that's the question. This is a Byzantine revival. Um, you can see the kind of polychrome work. Look at all of the domes. It's based on the Hagia Sophia. Really, really random when you think about it. That the Catholics are aping the Orthodox uh, style. Just don't think about it. Just go with the flow because mm. it's a it's a brilliant building. Um, but there is this kind of Byzantine re revivalism as well, and that's something that Duncan specifically he literally writes down. Oh, I need to go back to like. Byzantine frescoes at one point, basically. So that that is that kind of undercurrent thread. Um, does it really impact his work at all? I would say, like, not not really. He just talks about he talks a big game about the Byzantines, but doesn't actually like go into their work that that much. If I'm honest with you, so mm. I guess though, one, one, we didn't really talk about it too much, but the Celtic is a huge influence on Duncan. Uh, yeah, 100%. in terms of decoration, the the kind of clothing that they'll wear, you'll see. Has very Celtic forms or 
it's, it seems like it's Celtic, right? And I guess as well, I would just add um, in that during that period, you know, Scotland uh, has joined the union. Uh, you know, it's been established for some time, but there's constant questions about okay, what does it mean to be Scottish anymore? Uh, and Burns was part of that in the prior to the 19th century, and Walter Scott's wrestling with these questions in uh, various of his novels. And I guess the the turn to the Celtic is in part one way of answering that question. It's, a, it's an attempt to retrieve that. And certainly with Duncan and then post-Duncan, it becomes very important in what's called the Scottish Renaissance. Uh, people like Hugh McDermott and Edwin Muir will see this as like authentic Scotland that's been lost since the Reformation. Mm. So the, the and that that's a little bit later, but there is this sense of it's like a pre, pre-Protestant and thus pre-Anglo Scottish form that's been preserved in maybe the Highlands and Islands, and we need to retrieve that for the the revitalization of Scotland in general. Yeah, just just on that, have you ever seen some of the Celtic bells, Nathan? No, oh, I okay, haven't. Okay, okay, I'm gonna have to get a picture of them because they are off off the chart, off the chain. Basically, I think part of, this is where some of the Celtic revivalism came in. Hold on a second. If I do, uh, they're specifically. Um, Oh man, there's just so much cat. Okay, the one I'm thinking of is. Um, hold on a second. It's the, it's like a bell. Sh- okay, I've got, I've got the picture here. The shrine of Saint Patrick's bell. The shrine of Saint Patrick's bell. And um, I think it's the rediscovery of objects like this that kind of tapped into some of the Celtic. Um, Re- revivalism. Um, is this the one? This is the bell. So again, if you look look yeah. at all of the, the the knot work at the top, I mean, you'll you'll be interested to know as a Lord of the Rings fan, I'm hundred percent sure that for the elves, yeah, uh, in in the Jackson film, they they heavily borrowed from some of the ornamental forms. But th- there's only about like ten pieces that come from, come down to us from this time. This is tenth century, nine hundred AD. So relatively like later than you think um the celts you know you think oh it's anglo-saxons or by this time or whatever but in, in whatever in, in ireland and in uh, parts of scotland and in some of the islands this kind of style still remains and some some of it is just so be- un- exceptionally beautiful I, I i i wish there was more i wish we had more of this stuff um there's a couple of like um croziuses you know the, the kind of sheep's hooks or whatever mm. the the priests w- would have um but anyway, they're that's beautiful. They, um, they're not all LARPing, is what I'm trying to say. It is based yeah. on some reality and the rediscovery of these objects. And like you said, it's about how, like how do we define who we are? It's like oh yeah, it's the time before those pesky English <laughs> in, uh, interfered. So anyway, 50 minutes in, we've set the we've set the scene for that's how it should be <laughs> for Duncan for, for Duncan. Um, okay, I'm just going to go straight in and start start chatting if that's all right. Yeah, sure. Um, I would say that Duncan gets recognised as being pretty good at drawing relatively early on. At 11, he's sent to a, the, the Dundee School of Art. Uh, by 13, he's working as an illustrator for like a comic book, basically. Um, so that, that's pretty impressive. But he doesn't really produce any substantial works um, until literally his 20s, I would say. And again, as was the case in those times, a, <clears throat> a significant moment in his life was his own little miniature grand tour to Italy, where he went to Rome, Florence, experienced the um, <clears throat> Renaissance masters up close for, for the first time. And I'm 100% certain it is that point where he had a significant change um, in his style and the way he worked because... Um, I don't know if you knew, I've mentioned this before, but he is, I would say, one of the greatest modern um, egg tempera painters. So for those for those who do not know or do not paint, um, painting is effectively the depositing of pigment through a medium. So you've got your colour, aka pigment, which in those days was ground up something. <laughs> you know, it could be uh, a mineral or it could be a bug. Um, but you have to suspend that dry pigment in a liquid form, 
right? <clears throat> for fresco, that it would be in plaster. In oil painting, it was in linseed oil. But oil painting comes relatively late. It's kind of like a, um, I think, a 15th century innovation. From um, if you think of the Flemish primitives like Van Eyck, etc., you know the the, um, um, the Flemish Renaissance or whatever, they are they kind of bring us oil paint, uh, oil painting, and it's adopted by the Italians. But before Raphael, again, my PRBs again. Most paintings were done with tempera. So if you look at Botticelli um, or uh, Mantegna or Crivelli, and what they're using is instead of oil as the medium, they use an egg yolk. I've actually painted egg tempera before, and it's really, really hard. Like the setup is unbelievably tedious to do. Mm -hmm. um, but again, everyone thinks because we're used to digital or whatever, you know, a pixel is a pixel is a pixel. Um, Depending on the medium that you use, you get a different effect because you're you're in reality um, and the way that light passes through a painting. You know, what, remember when when we're seeing um, light, it's because it's reflected off a pigment, and then the pigment absorbs a variety of other colors and leaves one color behind. Now, what's interesting about egg, egg tempera is that it has um, lots of different like it can build up this kind of uh, glassy layered effect. It looks a little bit softer. It looks a little bit brighter as well. So mm. even just the medium that you have gives you a certain kind of effect on your style, if that makes sense. And I, I can't think of any other significant 19th and I, I know a few 20th century tempera painters, but he is the great. He is the great. And I'm sure of it. I'm sure it's because he went to Rome and was like, these guys before Raphael were pretty amazing. I'm, I'm going to become the world's greatest tempera painter, basically. So in terms of um, his actual approach to painting, he was a true pre-Raphaelite in that respect. Yeah, exactly true. Like yeah. Millet, Millet and Hunt, they're all painting in oils. You know, mm. it, this, I, I mean, when you really dig down, I, d I don't want to do them dirty, but if you look at the initial ideas that they purport, you know, they have their kind of little statement, et cetera, mm -hmm. you know, their little manifesto. They don't really do any of it at all. You know, it's just all nonsense. And they just kind of like it. The thing is, it's, it's just like a moving feast. You know, they, they, they mm -hmm. start off with something and it grows into something, but that, that it, it, it exists at the same time. Um, but it, I think it also shows as well, Duncan was very serious about his craft. It wasn't just the effect. He's thinking about the actual process of producing a painting as well. And, very, and he, he kind of... Um, th throughout his life, he's debating how he can change that or improve it or trying out different effects. He's he's not just trying to get, create an image, is what I'm trying to say. He's he's interested in the whole thing. Yeah, ex exactly. And maybe that takes us into our, our our first first work, which is the Orpheus triptych. Now he's again, I, I made all that big deal about egg tempera, and this is in a watercolor, so you know, <laughs> cl classic classic Pharaoh mover. But um, this is, so he's born in 66, this is 34. I mean, one thing I would say is that despite that entire kind of like childhood of like artistry, uh, like I said, no, like no significant work come down to us. I don't know why that is. And maybe again, researchers need to, to kind of dig into that more. But this is the, this is all often cited as his kind of first breakthrough um, mm. work. Um, so if he's 34, then we're talking, um, it, it is almost like the 90s, isn't it? 1890. So what what's going on in the 1890s? Well, you know, we've got other avant-garde movements coming through, like the um, secessionists in, in Austria, and you've got like impressionists and post-impressionists, all that kind of stuff. Um, what's interesting for me about this is the uh, the subject so again we talked about how prb just love classical and historical themes uh, sorry they love uh, medieval um but this is actually a classical theme so the story of Orpheus. orpheus um he descends to the underworld to try and bring back um his gf eurydice um who dies from a snake bite and he um what you can see here on the, on the left is orpheus um l lulling kerberos into sleep with his amazing playing he's also semi-divine orpheus he's 
badass on the loot uh, and has the power to make people sleep and cry or whatever. He can make animals do what they want, actually, mm. with, it, with, his, uh, with his lyre. And then in the middle scene, we've got him uh, speaking to Hades and uh, Persephone. And he tells his tale through the power of music and it moves them so much that they strike the deal um, where uh, Orpheus can take Eurydice out of the underworld. But if he looks back once during that process, he loses her forever. So it's kind of like a um, he, he, he gets the chance of doing it. However, right at the very end, you can see on the right hand side here, the triptych, um, you've got literally at the river Styx, where he's about to board with, with um, Charon's boat. He's, he has a moment of doubt and looks back and says, um, I, I want to check that she's there. And she's stolen away from him. Can you see there at the bottom? There's Eurydice being grabbed away. Um, what happens next? Well, you can see from this, there's, there's kind of like a little post scene at the bottom <laughs> Orpheus is head on a lyre it's 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 again this is a classic symbolist form if you look at um Knopf does a version of this for example which is a which is amazing so this, this is why I'm sure that um Duncan's kind of looking at the, the other symbolists I think Watts does an Orpheus as well um the secessionists are obsessed with the or Orpheus uh, uh, like McClimpt etc so it's, this is a really beautiful piece. It's not really what I would describe as classic Duncan, but it does mm. kind of sh show um, that he's able to work in different mediums. He's able to work at different styles. But this, this is a very complete and deep piece um, for uh, like a relatively early work. I, I was just going to add two things to that. One is I think you can see that he was a comic book uh illustrator beforehand the way it's set out you know you said there was that little like post credits yeah. scene yeah. It, it you could see this in a comic strip you know in a sense yeah, that's, uh, a, that's a really interesting point there yeah actually like and the use of framing mm. on the left hand side I, I really love his he's framed the right hand side triptych with a, another image yeah which is re really cool and really unique i hadn't seen that anywhere else so um it's quite clever and yeah the the only other thing is for because some people might not know the Orpheus story, but if you know Tolkien and you know the story of Luthien, she sings. Beren, her lover, is killed. She goes to the halls of the dead and with her song moves Mandos, who allows uh, Beren to come back to life. But there's certain conditions on it. You can see it's very heavily uh, taken from the Orpheus story. Um, Tolkien taking taking good Greek mythology there. Um, but is it worth saying as well? Like this would have this um, piece. You, you mentioned it was a mural. It was it was meant to be in like student flats, um, in terms of uh, where it was made. Like a, yeah, well, do you want to talk yeah. about that? Yeah, well, um, during that period, he kind of came under the um, patronage of Patrick Jeds or Geddes, uh, who was very influenced by the arts and crafts movement. But he wanted to. Kind of develop a school of art which wouldn't just be accessible to the rich his criticism of the arts and crafts is okay it's great what william morris is doing producing these um handmade products beautifully designed but only the wealthy can afford them he wanted to basically make it so that anybody could afford these works and so part of developing this art school was making the digs for the students and so he commissioned um john duncan along with four assistants um and they were they were female assistants who were meant to work with him to do these murals within the student accommodation essentially so this is just one of them and they did multiple uh murals uh which I, which i think is really touching like um 100 yeah I, know... I, I think i think back to my <laughs> student accommodation which was basically one step up from a brazilian favela and and think probably could have benefited from something like this somewhere so mm. uh or, or it's really luxurious, but it's just a standard, um, you know, ident like uh, IKEA room or, um, you know, copied across multiple places. This is unique to that room, to this, to the common room yeah. that people would go into. So it's something personal and means something to them. It, it won't be found anywhere else. 
there is something PLB of that as mm. well, because obviously um, you've got you know Rossetti painting um, is it oh, that, yeah. that, that, in, in Oxford as well. Um, oh, and Morris more... helps with that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so I, I wonder if it's kind of like ba ba the, the concept was based off that. But um, yeah, with, with, with when you're doing um, like fresco work or like monumental work you want to work in gouache and watercolors basically so that's mm. that's why he chose this medium but i mean you, like in terms of stylistic uh, choices you can see again lots of people in profile um quite tight palettes you know lots of greens lots of reds you know you're playing off that main contrast and then there's uh like a loads of um uh saturated blues in between as well so so there's kind of like two two axes he's playing off but he's not going for realism he's going for this like very mythic with the classical elements to it um i mean i particularly like that um scene on the right hand side i'm less keen on the orpheus striding it's a, it's a real tough pose he's gone for there <laughs> um but be a beautiful piece no, no doubt so let's look at the the next which is basically i think the the the, the real beginning of the formation of his kind of f like familiar style. Mm. And this is the taking of Excalibur a year later. Um, so Tennyson, you know, massively influential to the PRB, massively influential to Victorian society. Um, he describes um, the Lady of the Lake dressed in white Samite, um, which is a type of luxurious silk cloth emerging from uh, from the lake, and here you've got Merlin rowing that the young Arthur to pick up his sword, um, and there is there is something I guess kind of uh, PRB about it in terms of like you've got the kind of the, the boat scene here, you know, maybe a bit almost waterhousey, but apart from that it's something else entirely right mm. i mean i mean what he loses is the the detail in the nature so if you look in the background for example we're not seeing that kind of melee um depth or of um form or nature you're getting very much kind of like here is like a block of color etc same with the water the lily ponds these almost impressions but you are getting um I think particularly with the characters, it's all it's all about a character focus. He like sets the scene nicely, but the three major figures are Arthur, Merlin, and um, the lady, uh, I think. Um, and you've got Arthur transfixed with the beauty of the woman. Hmm. Merlin, who's sort of looking around, he's almost like breaking the fourth wall a little bit. He's sort of looking at us. He's like, you know what's coming next. You know, this is... Because of his foresight and foreknowledge, he knows what's happening. Also, I love his outfit as well. There's not That's enough great, red, <laughs> red Merlins. He's kind of almost like um, what's it? The Spanish Inquisition does <laughs> Merlin basically. Um, I love it. And then look at the sword here. If that here we've got a little bit of Celtic uh, Celtic influence inside inside there. You know that's mm. that, that's like that's a Bronze Age sword sword shape and and hilt. Um, so you, you you can see that he's pulling in these um, these influences. I mean there there are some very janky bits about this painting. The snake is awful. Like it's it's this kind of horrible uh, stretched out. Doesn't doesn't look real. Doesn't really work. Again, that's kind of this. It's meant to, it's meant to symbolise um, fate. You know, Arthur mm -hmm. Arthur's Arthur's fate. You know, Merlin knows this as well. This this is this is what's interesting about the whole um, story. It's kind of like um, it's a beginning and it's the beginning of the end at the same time. It's like um, Achilles knowing that he's going to die, but he joins the battlefield anyway. Um, and you've got the kind of maidens of the lake behind. They're sort of like discussing and, and looking on but again they, they are relatively weak compared to those three main figures um but I, I still think nonetheless it's a very unique piece you know who else paints like this um mm. who and especially with with the character design uh, with the character design and poses very unique very imaginative um and and um very special so i think it's it's interesting to me that um, obviously he's obviously got this gr this grounding in 
uh, good quality draftsmanship and characters. But I, I would say that, again, compare him to someone like Millet, for example, who was a genius from 18, right? Um, he is not at Millet's level yet, mm. and he's he's in his late 30s. And one, one of the reasons why I love Duncan is because he gets into it quite old. old. So if you're out there and you're an aspiring artist in your 30s, there's still hope for you because Duncan <laughs> manages to... Like he's 37 or whatever doing this, which is obviously a very well done work, mm. but there are some su- su- substantial amount of jank in it still. Um, uh, sorry, you, you go, you go. I've been talking too much. Too much. I was I was going to add a couple of things. One is just on you. You mentioned the characters being the heart of this um, painting, yep. and Duncan himself commented on the fact that in his view, the PRB focus on the natural background. And the subject is kind of disposable uh, in some of the paintings. So he talks about um, Hunt's uh, shepherd. Is it? Is yep. that right? Um, and I guess the Millet is an example of that too. They go and paint the uh, the natural scene first, and then they come to the character afterwards. It's almost like an add-on. Whereas for him, yeah. the subject matter is the heart of the painting. That's what's important. And everything has to fit or um, exemplify that in some way. And I think you really get that with the, you can feel the relationship between these three characters and the tensions already just by looking at it. Yeah, you're, you're, like that's you're, the heart you're of it. Right, yeah. Um, and the the other thing I was just going to add was that um, the Lady of the Lake, you can read her as the Lady of the Lake. She could also be Morgana, um, who is a an antagonist to Arthur, but also a helper at various points. Mm. And the very fact that she, the way she's holding the sword, usually when you see the Lady of the Lake holding the sword, she holds it in such a way that it's easy to to take. Mm. It's pointed towards Arthur. And it's it's almost like, is she taking it away from him? Yeah. That's, I mean, and then with the association with the snake, that's a kind of Morgana symbol as well. So there's, yeah, the, 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 the there's snake's wrapped around here. Is, yeah, the there's, there's snake's wrapped around here as well. Can you see on the shoulder? This is where, oh, again, yeah. the, 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 the jank makes it a little bit uh, uh difficult to see but yeah that's a really good uh, that's a great take I, I like it um just, just i just want to talk about the the style a second so one yeah, thing yeah. you'll notice is when you paint this is a i'm pretty sure this is this is when, when he's getting into temp uh, tempera right now right yeah. um the advantage of oils is that you can blend right so again sorry for a basic 101 painting lesson here but it's important um say for example you want to depict shadow, right? Um, imagine you're doing shadow on... Um, can you see her sleeve there on the left-hand side? If you're doing um, oils, you'd you'd have, like, two or three different values, two or three different, like, sh- uh, shades of um, lightness and, and darkness. And then you would blend the colours between the two. With tempera, you can't blend. It's a very graphic medium. So you have to sort of layer these blocks up, blocks of colour on top of each other so it, it feels quite blocky can you see how on her, on her sleeve you've got like a block of white and then a block of like off white and then um and then darkness and so it gives this really unique really be- I, I, again i find it I, i'm a big egg fan um someone can clip that by the way uh <laughs> But it, it's, it, it makes it, it marks it out as very different and a very warm feeling to it as well. But what he's done, look at the colours here. He's knocked them down. Everything's kind of a bit sludgy apart from Arthur and Merlin. You know, the, the green in the background is brought, the value's really low. It's not very bright. It's very dark. Um, everything's a bit grey. So again, just in terms of his colour language, it's very, it's very clever uh, as well to draw our eye to the different parts. It's this is actually listed as an oil painting, um, so I don't know if that go. adds adds to the grayness of it potentially. Because certainly, as later work, it is even brighter the blockiness of the color. You, you know what? Because uh, I think he does. Because I think some of it, so, sometimes he does doubles of the paintings as well. So he That's actually true, co- yeah. he he copies his own work in different mediums, and also he um, the, because it's because they, everyone has to sort of relearn egg. Um, <laughs> it, it's it's like I think this is like part he, he's trying to paint in a, te- a temporary style mm. I'm, I'm 100% sure or he'll be doing it part and part I, like I bet if he did an analysis on it because um, he's not blending it like you would do with a normal oil 
That's interesting. So he's even if it's not fully, the form's there. That's what that's what I go. think. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so um interestingly he follows uh Geds out to Chicago as well mm. uh in eighteen ninety-nine, so when he's um uh, yeah, like thirty-four. Um, he helps, he sort of partakes in, in the Great Paris Exhibition of 1900, which is, is an amazing, uh, again, one of the greatest feats of human cultural endeavor. Um, but I feel like with Geds, he's kind of like a bit of a dreamer. He's, he's kind of like, he's like a dreamer with slightly more cash than like Duncan is basically broke the entire time. Let's just say he's got no, he's got no money. Um, Geds has slightly more money. But these really big dramatic ambitions, but he hasn't like he, he always needs money and always like is relying on the state to back him up and the state never backs him up. You mm. know, all all of these kind of ski Geds is like he's like a wheeler dealer. I, imagine like an aesthetic um only fo- only fools and horses guy. That's that's the impression I get. <laughs> he, he, he I, gets... I think that's fair, yeah. Like he he he's got nice he's got good ideas like the art school, but he can't fund it. Yeah, exactly. But he's yeah. also a bit of a hustler as well. What I'm trying to, is what I'm trying to say. Mm, and so yeah. he, he literally ships uh, Duncan out to, to to be with him in Chicago. They have three basically unsuccessful years of cracking America, and then move back <laughs> move back to uh, to Edinburgh again. Yeah. Um, so that time is kind of like when they're trying to launch their kind of art studio thing. I, I feel like at that time that Duncan has this kind of ambition, like this kind of more idealistic idea of art and what he can do in it is like i can change the world and i think when he comes back to chicago he's just like a broken man and it's just like i'm not going to change the world i'm not gonna i'm i can barely survive i need to paint to eat and um during this edinburgh period he 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 basically uh, which is like 1907 to 1914 he, he creates some of his best work hmm. so I mean, it's obviously sad for him, great for us that him his like uh, total lack of money uh, sort of leads on to some excellent works. So I think we'll kick off with um, yeah, him to the rose. Well, just just before oh, that, go on, go on, I just on. wanted to add one of the things that somebody um, recorded him saying was that well, well, a couple of things while he was in the art school in Ed- um, Chicago, everybody was focusing on technique, and he thought emotion had to be the key to good artwork, spontaneous inspiration. Interesting. And that kind of translates again into, so, you know, you're mentioning he's broke, he's kind of down and out, he's trying to make money. Um, He says that um, unsatisfied desire is the key to, or the greatest incentive to art, or unrequited love is such a powerful thing that that can mobilise the greatest artworks. He says that during this period in Edinburgh. And I just well, wonder if his yeah. his own his own situation in some respects reflects that. Like he he has nothing, but there's somehow that then the desires for something are so powerful in him that they they manifest in these magnificent works of art. The, 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 and I do think there is an element of truth to this. And again, let's turn turn to Millet a second. Millet starts out of this as this child prodigy. He ends up, I think, going off with Hunt who's much older than him um, because he doesn't want to like follow everyone else and do what, what everyone else does. Um, but then he gets this kind of, he like does his own thing and then gets recognized mm. for it. And then just becomes like an absolute, absolute uh, establishment stooge and produces the lowest quality of works. Like mm. M- Millet has got to be one of the greatest drop offs of all time. And it's kind of like I, I wonder, like, what if he was rejected by society? What if mm. Millet had a had, was a was a Duncan, and then kind of like just desperate for money, and he was just knocking out like banger after banger just to kind of put food on his table? Could have it could have made him the greatest painter of all time. While you know he's a definite mixed bag, and like I said, I think Hunt Hunt ends up stronger than him because he has that hunger. Mm. So I think there is an element of truth to that. And I, I mean, I'm, I'm, go- I'm naturally, I'm going to tie this to Wagner Day, but if you think of Tristan and his old, which is a whole opera based upon that kind of emotion, uh, the desire to have satisfaction but never quite getting it, no wonder it's such powerful music. Um, mm. but anyway, let 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 me move on to to the painting. 
Yeah, so this this is the um, uh, kind of first piece from uh, the like the Edinburgh block, nineteen oh seven. So I'm just going to work out how old he is. He's like forty four. So again, like rel- relatively late. You know someone yeah. else who starts off quite late, and that's um, Van Gogh. You know he's he's like mm. um, starts starts in his forties, and then just like has this super productive period in his forties, and then obviously kills tops himself. Um, so, well, so and, again, and another one who has very little success in his own life. Yeah, ex- exactly. That's interesting. There's definitely like a, an, an archetype. Mm. Now, l- l- obviously, this is. I, I think at face value, you, you could criticize it by saying again, there's this kind of like post PRB sentimental sent- sentimentalism to it. You know, th- this is definitely like c- considering when it's been done, which is um, yeah, like 1907. Even that mm. kind of third wave of PRB is gone. You've got um, like Waterhouse is knocking around, so it's like him and Waterhouse are the only ones left producing this kind of this kind of work. Um, it's it's a roundel, um, which again was sort of brought back by the PRB, the kind of circular canvases. You've got a bunch of uh, girls singing a hymn around a rose, but there's some interesting stories uh, going on. So you can see. Uh, on the right hand side a mysterious woman looking in and you know she's kind of been knocked back um like her valley's been knocked back to give us perspective on the left hand side you've got a woman in blue who's kind of looking out to her um you've got uh, um the figures in the in the middle there sort of gazing out at us but also sort of looking what's going on like uh what are they looking at as part of it so you've got all of this kind of mystery and intrigue. What's happening? There is a swift, I think, which is flo- floating above them. A bridge behind, br- bridge behind them. You know, this is where the symbolist elements come in. Like, what's the what's the meaning of the swift? You know, he's put it in there for a reason. It's a really specific place. It's not to fill space. That swift has has to have meaning. Um, so you've got these kind of. Um, Underto- uh, undertones there's an element of classicism to it as well i think that kind of central figure could be um s- straight out of an alma tadema uh painting yeah. but then it's marked w- it's sort of balanced with the figures either side can you see um who are dressed in this kind of celtic revival style so you've got um mm. these kind of um in purple and in green on on e- either flank they're wearing these kind of beautiful embroidered outfits uh, you know one of the reason, one of the reasons why I love Duncan is that he's clearly like a bit of a textile nerd like me, and like he he spends time looking up costumes and the detail for it, and and it gives it that kind of authenticity at the same time, and um, and kind of interest. So what he's doing is he's taking like in the hands of a lesser artist, a bunch of beautiful women singing around a rose, could could be this kind of sentimentalistic boring uh piece of work um but he adds like a layer of intrigue and, and interest and you're you're asking like what's going on what's the story behind this at the same time um but again i, I think a very very beautiful piece everything's really well rendered but again it's it's that um i think this please tell me this one's egg otherwise i'll i'll really have uh oh, I'll, have egg. I'll have egg on my face hey there we go that's no yolk I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> temp, temp, temper pun, pun. This is oil. Oh, okay, right. I, I, I'm just going to quit. <laughs> I'm sure the screen. next one won't be. I, I, I was just going to add as well. The um, you can see the detail in this one. Like he's definitely moved into a more detailed phase in terms of the leaves and so on. Yeah, well, so, I, I, it's, it's it's ten years difference from his last significant mm-hmm. work, if that makes sense. So he's gotten a lot better in that time. And then, I uh, yeah, and and, and I, t- I I was just going to add as well the complexion of all the girls. I, I know what you're saying that there's a cla- there's a classical element to the maybe the middle one, but yeah. they all look like they could come from Scotland. That's something you think, that jumps you think out. So they, they kind of certainly the gaunt, red hair as well, gaunt, pasty, <laughs> malnourished Highlander girls. I, well, if you want to put it that way, yeah, I can I can definitely see these on a Scottish island. Um, if if I go out on a night out in Edinburgh, do I would you see girls like this? Basically, is that? Oh, that I'm not guaranteeing that. <laughs> <laughs> not anymore. Not anymore. Not anymore. Um, but then also, I, there's a city in the background which has got quite a classical 
dimensions to it. It's mm. kind of hard to see on this image, but it it definitely has that kind of um, the sandiness, perhaps, of a of a classical city. Yeah, um, that's interesting. So just, it seems like it's blending lots of different things together here. Just just on that again, that's quite a PRB thing to do to ha again mm. have that level of detail in the background. So interesting, Duncan slamming Millet about slavishness to nature and then does that with this piece but again it could be just yeah. a phase that he's going through ne never ne rule number one of art is like never listen to what an artist says about his own work basically because it's usually just <laughs> utter nonsense yeah well if duncan's to believe you know it comes from the unconscious in some way so he couldn't have possibly understood everything about it yeah true um but uh, I, I was also wondering as well the theme of the rose so the hymn of the rose the rose garden, the flower garden that you get in kind of medieval romances too, where it's a place of um, delight, but also temptation, a, a danger to the knight who is, you know, he's passing through, he's trying to get to the grail, perhaps. This is a place where he mm. can go astray. So it's, so there's an angelic quality, but then as you've mentioned, there's also some kind of disruption, but it's also somewhere that the viewer could be tempted into, perhaps. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, that's that's interesting. And, and yeah, it adds that other... Because there's something ghostly about those mm. two girls at the front. Do you know what I'm saying? They, they, they look taller than the, the other figures. It's almost like they're kind of... Um, what, one figure that the um, symbolists are interested with uh, and, and other mythic versions are is the, is the Lamia. You know, mm. this kind of like um, almost vampiric seductress that will literally eat you alive, basically. Yeah, and I, I guess Rossetti played a lot with that as well. Yeah, like his his tend to be kind of more like I, I know, kind of like hearty and full bodied lips. You know, the, these mm. these girls are definitely kind of like gaunt. Um, they will eat you alive. I mean, there's again, there's something interesting about the Edwardian woman as well. You know, where you know they've thrown their corsets away kind of thing. Mm. There, there is this interesting obsession with women from like the 1890s. You see this in, in with the new sculpture movement, uh, uh, Gilbert, etc., where they just, they're just really obsessed with women basically. Um, so anyway, let, let's maybe let's just keep on going. Otherwise we'll be, yeah. Uh... <laughs> okay. Okay, cool. So, uh, this this is where I'm having to rely on some of more of your interpretation uh, here. This is okay. uh, Ang Angus Og, which I'm pretty sure is like a Scottish um, uh, like f folklore tale. Mm -hmm. um, but j just in terms of the actual piece piece itself, you would be forgiven to think that this is uh, Tom Harwood's uh, like night out. <laughs> uh, he dresses a little bit like this, you know, dressed up only in a in a in, in a bow. And I have to admit, I've never seen any any outfit quite as uh, unique as this. But you've got this kind of like ginger Scottish uh, angelic figure here, um, recanting odes uh, on on a on a rock. There's something of, of like Arthur Husey about it at the same time, you know, the kind of balance of the rock and um, the angel. But I, I really like the rendering of the wings. You know, if, if you mm. see most angel wings, there are these kind of like dramatic full body wings of the of the eagle. These again look like they could be straight from like a jay or some kind of like quite small bird, giving it a, he, he has an almost like fairy like quality at the same time. Mm. Most definitely. And I, I think, um, so So mythologically, he's one of the Tuath Di Danan. These are like a godlike race in Irish mythology. And, and a lot of Scottish mythology is kind of uh, parasitic upon Irish mythology. Um, and he is associated with the spring. He, um, he, he was to be betrothed or fell in love with a bride, uh, the pagan goddess bride. But she was kidnapped um, by Bera, who is the goddess of winter. And so winter had kind of covered the seas. And to go and search for her, he had to sing a song of summer, which would calm the seas and thus give him an opportunity to go and find bride. And so he gets very associated with the coming of spring, with the sun at solstice. Um, 
And I, I think you certainly get that youthfulness from him in this mm. painting, um, a certain joy and energy about him. Like he's not, he's singing, but it, you know, his posture impo suggests a kind of liveliness about him. Uh, note, and I think, note the contraposte. My yes. hated, the, the hated, hated classical contraposte there. <laughs> Uh, I mean, the fact that he's a full nude makes it a very classical figure as well, mm. by the way. So again, it's interesting, that kind of Celtic Celtic element fused with classicism. I mean, just in terms of spring arriving, look at the shadows around the, the feet. The sun is coming from behind him. He's he's almost like bringing in the mm. light, the light, the light of spring. And you can see that rock in front of him, like darker. So it, it's quite clever. It's kind of like I'm arriving and spring is here. That's um, a great point. Yeah. It's, it's quite loosely painted though. If you if you look at the rocks and stuff, it, there, there is a bit of detail here, but again, nothing nothing like that kind of uh, Millet style. Um, I, I would describe this as an interesting novelty, but not one of my uh, not one of my favourites. Although, I mean, maybe I'll try that look one day and see uh, you know <laughs> see see what Essex thinks about next going conference. around. Yeah, exactly. Next conference, I'll just drop this look. I think just, I think he will be happy. Oh, uh, he'll be ecstatic but I, I think um the i agree with you it's it's not like one of my favorites and i think in part because his later stuff brings that beauty and ideal um it merges with the form and it kind of elevates your ex like you by just seeing it and i don't get that from this image um if anything it kind of makes me feel a bit ambiguous about it um that that's just my response to it no, definitely. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's let's move on. That, that one was uh, 19, 1908. and that was another oil, by the way. Oh, I'm just I'm just gonna just not mention the egg the egg <laughs> element anymore. I'll tell you when the tempera comes up. Okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, okay, I, I'm basically gonna be relying on you on all of the. Uh, uh, the, the mythological reasoning behind some of these, uh, Nathan, but this is Heptis bidding farewell to the city of Ob. Um, I, I can't talk much about the story itself, but in terms of the painting, again, the, the, you're obviously kind of see, seeing this um, quasi like hippogriff, half horse, half um, griffin um, mount with this beautiful. Um, alabaster woman riding on top um you've got the, the this you know she's obviously saying farewell to the city you've got the islands down below i, th I think for me the strengths of this painting compared to the, to the previous one are um around some of the imagination and creativity like when i think a lot of myth mythological creatures today are we're, we're sort of stuck in this kind of like 70s Dungeons and Dragons rut mm. of like boring, boringness, you know, that it's we're a slave to reality. And for example, you know, I'll give you an example of this you know, the um, the Harry Potter, those horse, the wing, those winged skeleton horse things, yeah. or whatever, just look rubbish, they look rubbish. While, while you can see here, this is like this creature is just absolutely wild. You've got these horrible, I mean, they're sh almost kind of shiny, polished limbs at the back, but they're obviously, you know, he's well studied both, um, like, um, th there's elements of both the lion, the horse, and the bird in those those limbs at the same time. And I just love that tail as just something else. It's kind of like um, this beautiful peacock, t like mm. uh, triangular peacock tail, that the head of the bird is like no other bird you've ever ever seen, and and the woman herself is uh, you know she's riding side saddle, so there's that delicacy to, to her as well, not the vulgar, nor normal riding. Um, she's kind of cre creased over, and you can see the like small creases mm. in her to torso, uh, you know the, her beautiful breasts, and then she's looking out with a three quarter view. Um, she's wearing nothing but her jewelry. I love that as well, you know. Um, she's got. You can see her necklace, her uh, armlet, and her crown. And and again, mm. it gives that uh, delicacy, delicacy, that vulnerability. But also, there's a, a, a 
rega- like uh, regalia to it as well. You know, she's an important person. And then I love her two hands, one tightly tucked in, holding the reins, uh, another drop down. You know, it's almost kind of like she's revealing slash pointing fa- farewell as she goes. Um, this painting is way, so, so much stronger, in my opinion. Just look at look at mm. the um, the forms inside there. You've, you've got the island balance with the cloud at the top. Everything fits perfectly. You know, I, I think this is basically his first masterpiece, in my, in my opinion. You know, this is a very good quality work. Um with intrigue and depth to it. I mean, that's what I would have loved a little bit more is a little bit of bit more symbolism um, in yeah. it. Totally agree. And I must confess, this is the the one painting I couldn't find very much uh, about the mythology. Um, it just couldn't find much on the, the internet, I'm afraid. Um, but it does seem like Hector was a Middle Eastern goddess of some kind and was often involved in various um, conflicts between the um mesopotamian gods um as a kind of peace broker or one that had to make concessions at various points and i do wonder if this kind of farewell even though we you know we don't know uh we don't know the story uh behind it um you know that idea of farewell of a compromise of having to do something that maybe she wouldn't normally do but it's for the good that that might be part of her character um, and then I, I just love the, you mentioned the tale. It's almost sci-fi uh, in some sense. Yeah, ex- like, yeah ex- exactly. And then the way it's, 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 it's posed, your eye is drawn up. So you almost feel the flight, the movement mm. of this creature up from the corner. Your eye is drawn upwards towards her. So it's just, yeah, it's, it's a great, um, he talked a lot about uh, rhythm in his paintings. And I, mm-hmm. I feel that movement there. No, de- def- definitely, and I, it it works compositionally, uh, and again, like um, the quality of his rendering as well. In te- like in ten years, has gone from again some of those janky janky mm. hands and everything's just not quite working very well, to again this is as good as Leighton or as good as a Millet at, at his prime. So, um, like I said, this he's in his forties. There's hope for all of us <laughs> to to achieve something as beautiful as this. Um, Interestingly, the this the scene he's posed, I would say last thing is um it, it works in terms of the lack of detail in the background. So again, yeah. like if if it was like this kind of melee um overdone um background, I think it would pull away from the main figure. That haziness gives us that kind of mystery and that kind of um depth uh, the distance. We feel like we're high up. Um so this is where the kind of background's playing off. One thing to mention to keep an eye on folks is these wings with the colors that are kind of uh, many level colors on these wings that's something that we're going to see again so keep your eye your eyes out for that um shall we move on to the next one yeah and, and this is um i would say like his one of his best known paintings mm-hmm. again I, it's got to be top top three um what, one of my personal favorites which is the um, the rider uh, the riders of the city? I don't, can you riders of she? Oh, there we go. Can... And it's our first tempera. Okay, there, there we go. Fin- finally, finally. <laughs> um, I mean, like I said, he, he he's been painting his oils like mm. egg the entire time, so there isn't as much marked difference here. But certainly, it's it's warmer and because um, you said this one's in in Edinburgh, is, it, is that right? Uh, this is actually in Dundee. Oh, in Dundee. Okay. Um, it's probably worth seeing this in person because I yeah. bet the colours will pop in a certain way. Because like I said, w- with oils, um, they, tend, they tend to be relatively opaque. So the, 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 there's, there's not as much to play with light-wise um, as, with, um, as with these. But what we greeted here is, again, um, in some ways, look like quite a simple PRB style procession. You know, this could this could come out of something like Hunt's early work um, as as well. It makes me, me think of instant, instinctively a bait with this kind of Celtic fusion to it. But when you um, look in uh, like look at some of the depth in terms of uh, the actual painting itself, there's lots of interesting things. Now, firstly, we've got um, a mess a messing around with uh, reality. 
and perception. So yes, we've got the four horses and um, you know as the centre of our attention, but there's the woman on the left hand side, and again she she looks like out of place here. I I mm. think like and, and again this is just like that melee um, messing around with perspective to fit a space um, in, in this slightly medieval style. You've got the background, which again, I think is just so sumptuous and so beautiful. And again, yeah. D D Duncan, again, just lying totally because he's put a lot of time and effort into that background and also the, the foreground as well. The background is all of, is all of kind of this water, these kind of um, uh, beautiful coastal scenes. And then in the foreground, it's, um, you know, maybe a bit more rocky, a bit more green um, flowers. Um so we've got these four, four four figures. Do you want to talk? You must know about the mythology behind it. Do you want to talk about that for a second, and I can talk about some of the meaning? Yeah, sure. So the um, the riders of Shi are descended from the Tuathdi Danan. So these are the fairy folk who uh, are in Ireland or maybe on the, the borders of Scotland. And uh, once a year, so there was a once the Tuathdi Danan were conquered, and there was a kind of pact made that they would kind of live underground and hidden places, but at certain times in the year, they would be allowed to ride forth. And so we are seeing an example of this today uh, in this painting, that the riders of Shi are coming forth. Uh, and it, you could maybe compare it to like um, Midsummer's Eve or Halloween. This is, I think, um, the Eve of St. John's, uh, John the Baptist feast. Um, and then uh, it's described as, um, bringing uh, mortals into the initiation into the fairy folk or into the the higher knowledge of the fairy folk. Um, did you want to talk about the specific symbols or? Um... I'm, I'm going to try and remember what they are. Mm -hmm. There is active power, passive power. I think it's wisdom and something else. I can't. I can't. Go, go yeah, that, yeah. So you've got the. The tree of life, which is wisdom. Yeah. You've got the holy grail, which is love. You've got the sword, which is active power, and the orb, which tells the past and future, and that's passive power. He's pondering um, the orb there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I like this touch as well, like the tree of life. You've got the snake on her. On well, it's ambiguous. Uh, it's described as being four men, but you know, it could quite easily be a woman. Uh, I find this one. Um, so maybe an Eve and the Serpent reference going on here with the Tree of Life. Yeah. Yeah. Um, taking the knowledge of the fruit of good and evil. Um, yeah, it's... Uh, and, and then, of course, you've got... like So this is a phoenix, I believe, down the bottom here. Uh, a medieval I think it's, depiction of a phoenix. I thought it was a basilis basilisk. Oh, okay. Or, okay. or a cockatrice could be as well. <laughs> what, what would be the significance of those, do you know? Well, it's it's a symbol of evil. I mean, the what's it? It's the 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 cockatrice is um, a creature. It's when it's when a cock lays an egg when the dog star is in the sky. If I remember my mythology correctly, which is a great, I love that that story. Obviously, yeah. a cock cocks can't lay eggs, but when there's a when the the fated dog star is in the sky, then you have these horrible creatures that can turn things to stone. So mm. it's, I think, I think it's a symbol of uh, stultification of uh, of corruption, and it's obviously an evil figure. And the riders are kind of grander, but I, I think it's more of like a looming threat. You know, like after after the riders pass, um, you know, the entropic mm. effects uh, remain. Um, it, I mean, it also sorry. conveys like these are. You know, we talk about fairy folks. We have this idea, and maybe like Rackham and Co are partly to blame for this. Yeah, that fairies are like these nice, gentle creatures. No, they're dangerous. Like if you get yeah. taken up by one of these, you're never seen again, and uh, that's why you don't go out at Halloween, right, in the Middle Ages, because that's when the witches are about and so on. So these are these beings are ambivalent again. He likes these ambivalent uh, mm. characters who there's beautiful, good factors to them. But there's also a darkness or a danger, perhaps. Yeah, it, it, exactly. And, and look at look at their faces again. You've got three mm. looking ahead, but we've got one looking at us breaking the fourth wall again. And um, he's kind of like, "Don't stare at my chalice too long. I'll I'll, I'll chalice you, boy." <laughs> um, but no, I, I just I just love the figures, and I just love the attention mm. to detail. I like the 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 horse armor. You know, these kind of unicorn horses. 
Um, you've got the magic wand of the uh, Tree of Life Rider. I love passive power as a symbol. I think, again, just his sim- Duncan's symbology is just like um, so intense, so so brilliant. Mm. And he's coming up with these ideas that no one else does. Like just even thinking about passive power, I think fasc- fascinates me. Uh, you've got the kind of Celtic revivalism in terms of the sword and the shield. Again, that's straight out of you go to British Museum. Um but again, some of the textiles and stuff. The, the horse on the right-hand side, again, interesting. He's definitely doing a hat tip to um, uh, M- M- McDonald, the, the Macintosh woman, mm. Macintosh's wife, who does these um, stucco and Margaret, guess, wasn't it? Yeah, Margaret, Margaret that's, that's right, yeah. The, the horse's hair is being rendered in a very Macintosh-esque yeah. way uh, there. But, I, I mean, I, I love it. It's great. Also noticed... The active horse has got a shrastica on there. You know, yes. Keith, Woods, Keith Woods approved horse there. Um. <laughs> yeah, active power. You know, you could embrace that imagery there. Uh, <laughs> um, interesting that this one doesn't have a mask as well. Mm, and yeah, I, I guess because that's the, you know, that's passive power, isn't it? He's kind of like, he's just pondering the orb. Everyone else is kind of like, you know, grab, grabbing people. I mean, I'm, I, I, you're, 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 you're right. In terms of the kind of color symbology as well, passive is like pure white as well. So again, it's a symbol of peace, I think, versus war. Um, and mm-hmm. also, it's kind of like the the horns of the first two. Interestingly, are like those kind of pointing, charging, while you know the the, the kind of double horns of the uh, active power. It's just in- interesting that again, active powers at the back. You'd think he's kind of be charging at the front. Um, so I, I just think there's just a lot, a, a lot of depth mm-hmm. into this painting. There's lots of technical skill. I love the background. I love the birds. Again, he's a real bird guy. Um, you've you've got like these kind of parrots and um, like doves uh, swir- swirling around, etc. You know, lots of lots of thought, lots of depth put into it. Um, and I think that's what makes it a, a great painting. And um, I should I should definitely go up to Dundee to see this. I think I, I might take the fifteen hour trip to uh, to Scotland to uh, check it out. But it's, it's, maybe I we think should it's very- do a a basket weaving expedition to all the Duncan's. Yes. Work. Yeah. That's a great, I'd love that. Yeah. Yeah. Or at least the ones in Scotland, we could do that. Yeah. Um, just, just a couple of further things, just very quickly. The birds of course are tied in with um, magic, you know, um, certain people are able to talk to the birds if they have magical abilities or like Siegfried in the, the ring cycle drinks the blood of Fafnir the dragon and thus is able to hear the birds talking to him. So the fairy folk kind of have that ability these plants are roses so again we're looking at the the rose garden and perhaps connected to the grail as a as a, a an obstacle to overcome and then i just wanted to mention this this kind of technique he's done on the the clothing here um it mentioned uh, one of the the book that uh, i read in prep for this uh, john kemple's book he talks about how he was quite inspired by burn jones's uh, some of burn jones's paintings in terms of this almost metallic feel to the to the the clothing, interesting. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, uh, most of Burne Jones's men are armored, or again right. have this very structured. And again, like the his his color palette is like jewel tones. Yeah, actually, Duncan is quite has got a very different color palette to Burne Jones. I would say he's much more vibrant. Much more, many more blues and reds inside his his work. But um, again, he is a real textiles man. Again, look at the the kind of the shoulder there, just the patterning alone. Just think about like trying to like you know shape what do they call it? Shape rotate a pattern onto a shoulder and then make it so that it looks perfect. Hmm. Uh, you know, blows my mind in terms of like qu- uh, quality. There is one annoying bit of jank in the painting, and that is. This is so fiddly. This is literally ridiculous. Oh yeah, on, on the chalice horse, the horse regalia on the chest is is at it's flat. You know, we're mm. seeing the chest up front, but the horse's head is in profile, and that's the only thing that's wrong with the entire painting. And it it does annoy my brain, but I'm willing to let it go because this is such a beautiful painting. And I think he's just trying to show off. You know, it's it's just about showing off the kind of Celtic. Uh, inspired so I, I think he sort of bent the rules a little bit to uh to, to do that fair enough shall we shall we move on to the next one yes let's, let's do it yeah 
Oh, wonderful. Well, do you want to do a, a quick, as, as well, the, uh, just as the expert? Yeah, as the expert. Yeah, so th this is Tristan and Isolde. And it takes place, I mean, there's va variations in the story, but essentially Tristan goes across to Ireland and is bringing back to Cornwall um, for the king, King Mark, uh, Isolde to be King Mark's wife. Uh, but there's there's a complication. They fall in love. Now, does this happen before, um, you know, on the journey? Or in this situation, is it, do they drink a potion, a love potion, which causes them to fall in love? In some versions of the story, the, um, Tristan had been wounded in Ireland beforehand and Isolde nursed him back to health. And they kind of fell in love at that point. But then Tristan goes across and tells Mark about her and then goes to bring him, bring Isolde back for Mark. And so she arranges that she and him will drink a death potion so that because if her love can't be fulfilled, then she would rather die. And there's a sense in which he has that too. But then the maid or the, the servant who's supposed to be doing this for her slips in a love potion instead. And so they fall in love. So you can see this painting as either they're about to drink the love potion um, and they're not yet in love or they both love each other, but they're committed to, to dying, as it were. But then they're going to uh, um, drink a love potion anyway, so their love will kind of blossom. Or perhaps they're already in love and they're going to drink a love potion to intensify it. So they, again, there's there's multiple ways you can read the situation. And I think the expressions kind of help to to have that ambiguity in mm. um, what they're feeling. Like, it, it's not obvious whether they're kind of resolve to death or then it's a moment about to become uh of of just genuine intimacy yeah perhaps but, both you know but like you said there's this four or five simultaneous readings that he's put inside there and again that, that, i think that's the that, that's part of this kind of uh, mythic skill a few mm. things i want to say just firstly in terms of her pose and the, ch the that kind of chalice or potion in her hand immediately makes me think of someone like Cersei, Waterhouse's Cersei, when she's summoning oh, yeah. summoning the monster. And again, I think that's, he's definitely playing on, the, uh, because there's several versions of Cersei with, with her pouring out water. Um, so I already think, you know, of that kind of witchy quality. Um, you've got, if you look at the background, you've got this kind of uh, squally sea, the foam spitting and, and howling. And again, it's like that... Uh, prophetic fallacy you know the, the the weather matching the 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 mood we're in and mm. there's this uh you know a squall could be its temptation its power it's um this force of nature that's uh, appealing to appealing to us here and it juxtaposes with the serene quietness of the two figures here but like you said everything that squall is inside their minds and inside their hearts and i think Again, yeah. he's 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 pulling that out for us. Again, just in terms of of the dress, you've got these beautiful um, uh, Celtic revival. I mean, his embroidered gown is uh, um, uh, intense. Interestingly, on the left, what he's trying to depict there, I'm sure, is a, a shot silk. This is where you weave the the warp and the weft to two different colours, and it gives you this kind of polychromatic feel to it. So you, the warp would be blue, and then the weft would be red. And depending on the light, it gives this kind of um, different effect. If you, you Google it to see some some examples um, often. Um, and then you've obviously got the kind of um, all of these kind of Celtic knots. But I wonder whether, again, there is a symbology in the knots itself. Mm. You know, they're, they're in a they are kind of wound up. They are bound together. They're they're fated, but they're also stuck. Um, interesting. Like he's also framed the scene really beautifully with the rigging. So, yeah. like, what? Why show like a couple of tackles? You got to think. You got to think to yourself. Why has he chosen to put something in there that would distract it? But actually, I think if if you if you just take zoom your head back a second, the tackles give um, Tristan strength and um, weight and power behind him. Do you know what I'm saying? There's more weight on that right hand mm. side, um, and also there's the kind of harshness of uh, the workman's tools while you've got that kind of beautiful gold on the left hand side you know it's beauty versus power it's um 
you know, the, the ruggedness of ropes versus the daintiness of um, ornament. And then you, the, the picture itself is framed by the two sides of the winds. You know, we're, we're literally inside the sail as well. It feels like we're encompassed. And that's how he places us in that zone. It's a very intimate, well, like we're positioned outside the boat. Can you see, I, th I think? Yeah, um, I agree. Yeah. So, so there's something voyeuristic about it. And then the faces themselves. I mean, just the nobility in Tristan's face is just like staggering. You know, he could command armies with um, that, that prowess. Uh, and the delicacy of hands again. So again, I think another exceptional painting with so much depth to it. I love the um, the the strand of hair, which is also pointing across the uh, great shout. The yeah, yeah, to like drawing him in, or almost. Um, and and I I almost wonder as well. Like you made a really great point about the contrast with the background and the stillness of those two, and it's almost like this is the moment of decision where everything hinges upon and after this it's like all the effects are going to play out but it, it's almost like time slows down in that moment you know you can imagine it in a film everything's mm. going on around and it's just those two characters with this choice to make it, it it's a very climactic um yeah you know it's it's like um wagner's opera but in a painting Yes, Almost. yeah, definitely. There again, there's that drama and tension, un unresolved tension. Yeah, yeah, and uh, I, I was trying to work out if this was a some kind of snake or some some creature because there's there's definitely a some facial feature here, um, which would like be in two, a... two, two, it looks like two snakes intertwined, doesn't it? So again, I think I think it is yeah, it's, it is symbolic of their their you know they are fated, um, yeah. Top, top work, Duncan. Top work, yep, indeed. And and maybe maybe just to comment as well, because you mentioned Tristan's heroism, and you know Isolde is very very beautiful in this painting too. And one of the things that Duncan really hated about um, modern art of his period was this kind of ugliness or focus upon, like a cynical focus upon um, the subject matter. And he wanted to present what was noble and ideal and beautiful to kind of elevate the viewer in the process. Yeah. Um, and I think you can see that in these forms. Like these are these are kind of ideal types of human being. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So that kind of marks the end of his Edinburgh phase. And I think he gets a little bit of fame, ends up moving to um, St. Bernard's Crescent, where he has another substantially significant um, artistic period. But I mean, we've, we've already seen kind of like him go from this kind of relatively loose pa painter to like very powerful. And, and I think um, St. Bride here is probably his most well-known work. Hmm. I know maybe his greatest greatest work. I still love the riders personally. That's my number. That's my favorite. But um, I've I've seen this one in person, and okay. it's it's just mesmerizing. It's it's truly stunning. It's it's quite a big piece. That's one thing that maybe doesn't con convey across the screen. This takes up like a large portion of the wall in the gallery, um, but it just commands attention straight away the use of color just draws your eye do you want to, do you want to talk about the mythology behind it sure so we've I, i've already mentioned bride as a pagan goddess but in uh irish and scottish kind of medieval catholicism there emerges a figure of saint bridget or saint bride and this this uh, painting is called saint bride and this is the the figure in the middle the young girl uh, she is uh, being carried by two angels. You can see in the far bottom uh, right-hand corner, this is the Isle of Iona, which is kind of the cradle of Scottish Christianity. So you're getting these ideas of pagan and Christian coming together in this character, perhaps that Celtic uh, significance coming through. St. Bride was uh, believed to have been carried to the nativity to be an attendant of Mary's during the birth of Jesus Christ. And so this is what's being depicted here. And what I love is you can kind of tell this through, even if you didn't know the like that story, 
what the angels are wearing kind of signifies this. Because if we look at the this angel, all of the imagery on here presents the life, uh, rather the stories around the nativity. So you've got the Annunciation, you've got the angels appearing. Let me just uh, click on that because that might be a bit better. You've got the angel appearing to the shepherds. You've got the wise men uh, being led by the star and then kneeling before the infant Jesus and the Virgin Mary. And then, you know, Jesus lying amongst the animals and Mary and Joseph here. And she's looking backwards. So this is kind of looking into the past, perhaps, or what's been. On the other angel, we have what's come. She's looking forward. And so she's looking to the future after St. Bride's intervention. So you've got Jesus as a young man, as a carpenter. On her back is the baptism of Jesus. We have Jesus here welcoming the little children. He raises Lazarus from the dead. Um, this is the Last Supper on this corner here. You then have the crucifixion, the resurrection and the ascension. And so this is what's to come for Jesus. But I think there's a there's also another significance here because she's in prayer at this point. And there's there's almost a sense in which through prayer, the the petitioner or the prayer be, almost enters into the gospel story. It's not just something far distance in the past, just as the Eucharist in Catholic theology is like a, a re-sacrifice of Christ. It's actually happening once again. It's almost in prayer you become part of that story and live it for yourself. And so she's entering into the very heart of the, the gospel story. Um, would you add, add anything else to that in terms of the mythology and symbolism? No, I, I think that's um, wonderfully put. I think just, just just playing off that idea of the past and the present, mm. it's interesting that we're seeing the journey midway through. We're in. The, what do we see? We see water. We see the sky. Like you said, you see the island in the background, but we're in a in a place of Heideggerian becoming. You know, mm. so it, there's it's almost kind of like a, a suspended, physically, like literally and uh, like metaphorically. But we're between two places here, and I think that's um, significant. Yeah. Um, in terms of um, the actual painting itself, there's there's the movement. So can you see that that these kind of legs push back from both of the angels? So even despite like their their wings don't feel like they're flapping around that much, but the legs show us that they're kind of moving forwards. But also he's added in a number of <clears throat> very well rendered animals as well, including. The cutest is that like a seal or something like that at the bottom. That's the bottom a seal, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Never has a, has a seal been in such theological. That's the most theological seal ever, I think. Um, <laughs> it's it's probably like related to Saint Francis in some way. I'm sure. Yeah, ex exactly. Um, there's a joke about seven seals in there somewhere. Anyway, um, <laughs> and, and and nice to include seagulls, like. Of you yeah. know, normally he does all these other birds, but a seagull's so mundane. But it's what you would get on the Isle of Iona. Um, and, it's like and, the ordinary coming into this. Yeah, you're, you're right. That there is this kind of mix of uh, reality and unreality. So mm. uh, again, Bride is definitely like um, uh, she's tied to reality. Like, look at her hair; it's relatively like naturalistic. She's wearing this kind of nor normal outfit. But then, not only are the angels. You know they have these ridiculously beautiful wings again mm. that are unlike any other bird's wings. You know that they're, they're like totally unique and interesting, with gold all along the tops. But also their hair feels very uh, unrealistic. You know it's almost kind of like um, molded together, <laughs> um, and that comes through even in the ribbons. Can you see the ribbon off the left angel? That's oh, not yeah. a, that's not a ribbon that's floating that like it's being dragged behind. Um, I don't know, like a kite or something like that. It's got this very square um, descent down, if that makes sense, which again makes it feel like otherworldly or unreal mm. in its um, uh, its movement. So I, I think you've got um, th this idea of suspension, this idea of movement, um, but 
so it's kind of like uh, this is almost like Schrodinger's box or something like that. It's like it's like a bit of a qu- a quant- quantum state, um, yeah. the past and p- p- and future uh, existing together in exactly the same place. I mean, let's just talk about the box for itself as well, because he's framed the painting using this kind of ornamental device, but then has burst out of the uh, frame by putting the angel's foot lower down from it, and then the the wing and the seagull. This is a classic illustrative technique to fool our brains and to give you that kind of 3d uh, effect that pops um so it, it's a clever way of uh, you know making things pop out yeah. um and, and just in terms of the the kind of background landscape again this really beautiful like i love the clouds they're just so mm. so so lovely um but there, there is a kind of a simplicity a calming simplicity to them as well so you know i think this painting's got everything it's um it's got detail. It's got symbology. Is it me or does the, the the angel on the right look a bit like Poe? That's one. That's what I, I first. Uh, I see it. Yeah, I see it for sure. <laughs> we'll get her. Um, to, we'll get her to dress up next year as instead of uh, Britannia. I want to see um, her her drawing her version of this. That's what. Oh, I'm that's a good thinking. shout. Yeah, yeah, that's the challenge. Mm-hmm. Yeah, if she if she um, is it. And just just on the clouds, like I've I've visited a number of Scottish islands, and I feel like I've seen this scene at some point or another interesting like it, yeah it, and he spent a lot of time on the scottish islands himself um at various points so like he, he captures the just the mood very well um this kind of That's calm cool. calm afternoon sort of thing but with a bit of roughness in the sea yeah. um and just on the kind of popping out um i saw in the chat earlier gifts ungiven was was here she had mentioned on a previous stream that that is also tied to like being connected to the divine so like kind of breaking the the walls of earth and heaven in some way. So I, I think, you know, again, you mentioned past and present bound together in this. You've got heaven and earth almost bound together in yeah. this this one True. moment. Yeah. Absolutely um, just, stunning. Just, just one last thing on, on the clothing as well, because mm. this is where, where I feel like he, he has this group. Here's this grounding in reality and, uh, you know, he does the legwork in terms of um, symbology around objects. You know, we saw that with the riders where he's like, he's gone to like a museum to look up what Celtic <laughs> Celtic swords and shields look, look like. But then he's also extrapolated a lot out and said, look, imagine I'm some kind of awesome Celtic angel, which has got this embroidered robe. He's got like elements and symbols that are pulled straight from the kind of Celtic reality. Yeah. Uh, and then, arranged it in a way that's unlike anything i've seen you know have you ever seen a robe as beautiful um or even like just structurally like that i've never seen anything like it so he, he's always playing with um he's rooted in reality but he takes it and then says what if it's an eight like yeah what if it's a celtic angel mm-hmm. uh mid mid flight what's he what's he wearing and you know even if you presented the robes just by themselves, I think it would be a very beautiful painting in its own right. So, and you know, we were talking earlier about the Celtic being, you know, trying to get pr- prior to the Anglo influence, and you know, Christianity is often seen as a kind of complex factor in that. Especially today, you know, in our online discussions, you know, is Christianity an alien force or whatever? He's saying he's kind of presenting. Look, these could be integrated. Um, this is what a Celtic Christianity really would look like. And yeah. the symbols of it would look like um, it's really like embedded in that, and and the figure of Saint Bride in particular as well. Mm. You know, Bride being the pagan goddess. So he just does so much. He does yeah. so much. Um, speaking of biblical themes, yep. So th- this is kind of more standard, traditional um, painting in in many ways. Uh, which is the presentations of of gifts to to Jesus? Um, again, I, I kind of put it in here. I, I don't think it's his strongest work. He he ironically doesn't do these kind of theological pieces that um, well, um, but it kind of shows some of his best features in terms of his attention to detail with uh, with dress. And I just particularly like the the wise men. So mm. I don't know if you I don't know if you've seen um, the one on the left has got like a yin and yang symbol on it. So there's kind of like an almost oriental vibe. Oh yeah, he's, yeah. He, he's he's holding um, his kind of uh, pot of uh, for, uh, of myrrh, 
Um, but can you see that there's some Kufic lettering on the top there? So it's kind of like um, almost like an Islamic uh, style uh, vase. So again, he's kind of like represents the, the Orient. You've got um, what's the uh, black guy called again? He's got uh, Melshazzar. Melchior. Mel is it Melchior? Is it? I can't remember. There's Balthazar, Melchior, and one of the others. I'll find out. I think Balth Balthazar is the the black guy, isn't it? That's his name. But um, he kind of represents uh, Africa. Um, but then you've got kind of like this Aryan, <laughs> Aryan Celtic, um, almost kind of like could be like a Slavic god or something like that. So I wonder whether he's trying to represent like the like th the East, the West, and Africa as these kind of three um, three figures. Um, his robe. I'm 90% sure is taken. Uh, he's heavily inspired by this. There's, there's this Germanic embroidery um, of um, of that kind of eagle. I've seen I've seen it before in golden golden thread, and again it's this amazing amazing cape. But he's added in kind of Celtic um, symbol uh, symbology in it, uh, and uh, imagery to it. I think ironically the, the weakest part of it is like. The weakest part of this is it's done in a sea setting, which just feels wrong. You know, you've got the kind of coast, coastal back, back like that's fine, but like it's got to be surely it's got to be rooted in some kind of stable. I don't know, like a bit, a bit it's, strange. But it's that Celtic thing again. I think he's going for, isn't it? And Mary and uh, Jesus, to me, they look again like they could be Scottish or Irish. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, what, and yeah, then what if? What well, so, and then and then if you think of the so a Germanic, well, that would be East. That would be a man of the East. So it kind of works geographically in that regard. That's um, clever, yeah. Um, but I think you're right. Like it, it does kind of not quite fit with the setting um, very and, well. And I just really dis I dislike the 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 Mary and Jesus again. I think this is just boring sentimentalism. Sentimentalism. This, this is the kind of the worst parts of that kind of third wave PRB. Mm. Um, it's just kind of like these very they're very beautiful but like skin deep skin deep figures and I, I feel like i would rather have a mega jank um huge head jesus from the renaissance or medieval period you know when they you know they do those really ugly babies i think uh -huh. there's more ca character and depth to, to something like that than this kind of beautiful boy sadly i do i do really love the rendering of um mary's blue coat there can you see and again like he this is what Please tell me this is a an egg painting, please. Um, it is. It is. Oh, there worry. we go. Good, because <laughs> uh, like that is like a masterwork of of robes in egg, and you will not see like. And there's a Crivelli. I would say is the other. He's super into his textiles, and he's the other most excellent um, like robe painter in tempera. But Duncan eclipses him with those robes there. I'm sorry, it's just it's so beautiful. He captures the depth of cut color, all of the folds. But there's there's a graphical element element to it. He's sharpened stuff up. There isn't any curves. Everything's at an angle. So there's a bit mm. of tension in, inside there. I just I just wish I just feel like yeah, the Jesus just doesn't do it for me. I think he's just a bit boring, and um, it's a shame because I think it would have been another good character. Just just on the wise men. So this is. Um... Melchior, who is depicted with long white hair and a white beard right, and okay. a gold cloak. Uh, this is uh, Balthazar, and this is Caspar. Um, but he's changed the colours uh, for these two. But with uh, Melchior, he's kept it what it would would be normally. Um, right. Ah, oh, yes. <laughs> this is an exciting one. The Mask of Love. Would well, you want to take us through through? through this one okay so this is uh, this is a tempera we can all be pleased with and uh it's really his presentation of all the different kinds of love in mythology legend and so on and uh it's a, it's also i think a little bit of a greatest hits in some ways like he's he's including figures that he's painted before uh in this painting so at the front we've got orpheus with the lyre um playing away with his an with the animals uh being tamed by that. Then we've got Semele. Uh, she was um, a lover of Zeus, and she was tricked by Hera into asking for Zeus's true form to be revealed to her. Well, Zeus's true form is fire. It is the sacred fire, which 
uh, those of you who know your, um, is it Kalanges, Kalanges, um, the ancient city writer, he talks about how Greek religions all around the lighting and discovery of the sacred fire. So she is enveloped in flame and uh, Hera has a nice laugh at her expense. Um, we then have uh, Psyche, or Psyche, uh, the lover of Eros. She was tasked by Venus as one of her trials for being reunited with Eros to uh, retrieve from uh, Hades this casket, which had a certain powder or chemical within it, which uh, she had to retrieve for the gods. And so she's carrying that there. Next to her is Sappho, uh, the poet of Lesbos, i.e. lesbian. And then behind the, the OG, the OG lesbian. There were no lesbians before Sappho. <laughs> well, I, I, the, the Greeks and the Byzantines just called her the Divine, which I think is such mm. a beautiful name. The Divine Sappho. Lovely. The Divine Sappho. That is quite nice. Um, interesting, though, she's not playing her liar, whereas Orpheus is. I, I wonder well, she, about she's, that. She's always depicted as, because, you know, one of her lovers goes off or whatever, she gets married. Mm. So, uh, again, it, there, there's quite... Sappho is actually quite a popular figure in this kind of class, new classical wave, high Victorian wave, not because of the lesbian connotations randomly, but just because of, um, do you know what I'm saying? Not not because of, uh, yeah, not from a sexual point of view, but more, more, more kind of like she's just this kind of tragic, uh, tragic figure. And I think she captures the mm. imagination of the time. And you can see that, you know, she's holding her heart and looking upwards. There is that unrequited love in some way yeah. going on. Then we've got a very different kind of love with St. Francis and the wolf here. Uh, and then behind, we've got uh, Isolde, and she's holding the cup just down here. It's a little bit hidden. Uh, some birds going on too, which is quite nice. Is, then that, Fra in is, that, is that Francis and that you can speak to the birds? Yeah. I think that's one of the miracles. That's right. There's a flock of birds who listen to a whole sermon by him and then at the end fly away, uh, which is... Uh, um, a beautiful story, I think. That um, happened to me once with an art lecture with a group of pigeons, actually, Nathan. Really? Yeah. No, I'm just no. <laughs> <laughs> I wish that was true. Probably more attentive. Just imagine, than just imagine, ma imagine a six foot three man just ranting to pigeons about pre-Raphaelite painters, and then they all fly away. I feel like this is something I would see on Twitter as a, a short or something. Sadly, yeah, exactly. Um, so behind Isolde, we have uh, Elaine, and she's carrying the shield of Lancelot. Uh, she was his lover, but he left her for Guinevere, and so she is heartbroken, She and she dies of grief eventually. Well, I was, I was going to say, that that's in um, Idols. Um, there's an entire like chapter of Idols devoted to it. Mm. And um, in, well, in, in Tennyson's version, they don't get together... She, um, Lancelot arrives as this kind of unknown, um, unknown knight because he's um, he's trying to like win a tournament to, to impress Guinevere. He's he's with Guinevere at that time, um, yeah. and she just like falls. She's like bes besotted with this this knight basically, and then he basically uh, leaves her the shield, and she literally like dies of grief and gets sent across to Camelot holding the shield. It's that's, that's one of my favourite parts of Idols. It's it's so good, that entire chapter. Anyway, carry on. That's fantastic. I, you know, part of me really wants one day to do like a Tennyson stream of some kind or something, because I just think that, that he's so important. Have, have, um, have, have, have you seen the... Tennyson hired Margaret Cameron to do um, some photography of mm. idols as well which is again it's it's super pioneering so there's loads of these kind of photos of the different scenes in this kind of victorian style so maybe we need to do we'll get you to recite the poem and then we can discuss it chapter by chapter painfully in 24 <laughs> hours it's probably take more than 24 hours to do the whole lot but uh foundations of idols yeah I, exactly I now. yeah um this is uh saint hugh the boy saint um i think he was 12 when he joined uh uh, a holy order. And then behind we have uh, Orcasson and Nicolette, who are two kind of medieval lovers who, through various tri trials and travails, managed to come back together after, you know, several years. Their, their true love is never conquered. They have to run away from the king and so on and so forth. And then here we've got uh, Raphael, a young Raphael with his mother, 
And I love this in particular because uh, it looks a lot like uh, the Virgin and Child or the, the Sistine Madonna mm. to, to me. Um, maybe I could see if I can find a picture of that. Um, it's like a meta, a meta reference to Raphael's own work kind of thing. Yeah, because uh, it's just the way she's holding and, and the colour scheme. Uh, I'll, I'll stop that and I'll, I'll just show it quickly. Um, I think that's it looks um, very similar uh, if we go back to it. Uh, just, just uh, I know it's a bit different, but it, it seems like this is Mary and, and Christ in some ways. And then behind, um, we've got uh, Dante here. Um, and these are Paolo and Francesca di Rimini, who are in Dante's Inferno as the two adulterous lovers who they come across in hell. And this, to my mind, is a, a reference to a Rossetti painting of these two lovers. Uh, and if you'll permit me, uh, Ferro, uh, uh, I'll, I'll show that one too, um, because I think just the pose... Just, just, as you, just as you do that one, they're mm -hmm. also significant because those are the lovers that read um, the romances and it was Lancelot and Guinevere getting together that got them together, basically. That's right. Um, yes. Yeah. So, and and so, so they're so reading it's, it's that. Yeah, yeah. double. Yeah, it's a double. It's a double significance, basically. Yeah. And just the way that we're posed in the flames is almost I mean, I mean, identical. This is this is peak. Like early Rossetti is so good when he's like going full medieval. Basically, I think it's just such passion and such depth. This is this is the example I always use when talking about the power of media on 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 minds, and it mm. and you know Dante realized, you know, because he was used to be a romantic poet. That's what's interesting about it. That in some in some ways, um, the the um, uh, the inf the inferno is kind of like penance for his his romantic part past, and he and he's kind of like saying, look, love poetry in the wrong hands, in the wrong context, can be really dangerous. And, mm. I, and I, I think it's really interesting where in today's society, we leave our minds open to any media at all. You know, we think that yes. I, I can read anything, I can do anything, and it won't affect me at all. And what Dante knew was, like, even, like, what we would consider maybe corny love poetry um, can have a significant impact, you know, and, you know, took these these lovers to hell because of um a poem and i think mm. I, that, that i love them as a as a as a symbol of yeah the the dangers of art you know art is a very danger the the word is a dangerous thing it's a magic magical force yes exactly i i would say though as well like i totally agree with you that you know that's one of the meanings of it but they look very serene in hell they look kind of idyllic and there's, there's, there is, all, you know, with their eyes closed together. And I do wonder as well if you can read this as, you know, even though there's we're in hell, our love is so great that we would rather go through that than anything well, else. Well, Rossetti, Rossetti would do that because he he obviously was obsessed with May Morris. Yes. And they effectively lived together as a, as a I hate to say it, as a polycule later on in life. <laughs> And and so you know him being the you know these kind of serene adulterous lovers would would suit his own personal circumstance quite nicely, but mm -hmm. um, I, I'm not sure Dante intended it to be as serene as beautiful as that. But... Yeah, yeah, I imagine this is William Morris deep down inside. Um, but uh, poor William Morris. Anyway, uh, back back to uh, Duncan. Uh, let's see. So we're, we're, we've almost covered all of them. Dante is looking up to one of the angels who carry St. Bride, or one who's very similar. And you could see her as a kind of Beatrice figure here. You know, he's being pointed towards the light by her. Um, this is uh, Percival, the knight Percival, who goes in search of the Holy Grail. And this figure here is fairy-like, but with the arms outstretched like that, it could be a Christ symbol as well. And he's obviously looking in the, that direction with the halo. And then finally, we've got, um, let me get the name right, Alcestis, who, um, I forget who she was married to. She's an ancient Greek uh, character who, um, her husband was kind of condemned to death, but he would be allowed to survive, 
provide Apollo managed to get in this kind of condition where if somebody else offered to die in his place, then he could survive. And she loved him so much that she put herself forward. And so this is death carrying her off to Hades. I, I really like it as well because death is in this uh, portrayal, not kind of gloating or anything. It's actually kind of sad about the situation. Mm. Um, no, definitely. Yeah. Um, so N yeah, th those Nathan, are all the d portrayals. Can of I say love. that was that was a, a brilliant that you managed to get all of that together. Thank you so much because I think that's it, it. Just adds so much depth to the painting, mm. knowing all of the different figures. I mean, I, I will do just just my five pence on this quickly. There is a sense of movement in the painting, but it's it's a slow procession. You can see everyone's slightly tilted forwards. The dog is not in, in the front, kind of sets the pace. So you get this idea of love moves slowly. You've got the sense of verticalism, lots of bodies all pointing up to the sky. Um, like the, 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 the hoof um, of the animal, the, um, the, the, the stick of the joust, etc. So you've got all of this kind of these kind of lines pointing up. Mm -hmm. um, the the color palette is just like super unsaturated, sorry super uh, super saturated and very very tight. You've got like um, blues, but there's quite a lot of it, it's tight. But there's there is a lot of variety. So you've got a purple, a red, a blue, um, a green. You know, so there's actually a lot of color variants, but within a yeah. very tight um, value range at the same time. Um, I, I just think it's a very I think it's an unbelievably ambitious task. If you like, imagine just depicting one of these figures is a, an is a masterpiece in itself, and then you're combining them all together and trying to create harmony and movement between them, and 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 you get this um, um, mournful beauty to it. You know that there's um, ecstatic love, tragic love, heartache, and uh, everything else in between. Um, and and so I, I just think it's uh, you know one of the great testimonies to all of the the love the love stories and love songs of all time. So it, it's truly stunning, and I, I think it also shows a, a sensitivity and nuance to his like when we talk about love. Okay, somebody maybe sophisticated might draw on C.S. Lewis's Four Loves, but to present it in this way with all those stories with all the different kind of um, textures of love. And bring them all together and make you think okay these are not necessarily so far apart actually the love of saint francis is right next to the love of isolde but there's a difference there and you can kind of think about that through this this painting yeah that's just yeah that's true yeah I, I think it's really really deep and then and then uh just all the connections to other paintings and um you know others who had uh, kind of portrayed love i and and then just also to to meld together the classical and medieval um, historical but it, but it, and yeah. mythical, but it works well. though. Yeah, I, I yeah. think that's that's it. No one else has tried to bridge those two things together at the same time, but it, but it works. Yeah. Just uh, one last reference. I, I'm whenever I see a procession, I immediately think of um, Leighton's procession of Kimberway's icon. which is a, which is again one of his first big works, and it's mm. a procession similar to that. So again. He's still referencing that that kind of uh, that classical school that I mentioned, the classical realism. realism. Um, but yeah, an, another significant work, I would say. Yes, yes. And let me just see where that one is, because I think that needs to be on the list of uh, ones to visit. Um, this one's in Paisley, which is just outside Glasgow. So we can add that to the list. Okay, we, you, you have to create a little Google map and we'll do like a lad's tour. La, lad's painting tour. Just, yeah, boo, booze and, and Duncan. Uh, Nathan, we're, I, I've got to go relatively soon. Do you mind if we skip okay. to, the, to, to, the, to the last one, um, if that's okay? Yeah, that's that's fine. Let me just, uh, I'll get out of this. That was it, um, that was it, yeah. Oh, sorry. So, um, towards... We haven't really talked much about his life during this uh, time, but um, uh, was it The Mask of Loves, 19, 1921? I, I would say that the impact of the First World War was absolutely massive on Duncan's life. The the, the few commissions that he had have were like totally dried up. Mm. Um, this is what I'm saying about he's a man in the wrong era. You know, 
this is the time of like Wyndham Lewis and the modernists and the futurists, and they're producing these vivid and vital uh, works, um, which I very much love. But you know, D Duncan's sort of, sort of he's playing from the high Victorian hymn book that's dead and buried. You know, after the First World War, like that's the day that tradition died. You know, a generation of men and craftsmen and um, and feelings of subtlety and honor and nobility were, were like were crushed uh, at the Somme and you know he didn't he was too old to serve he was like 47 when first world war happened um he just about made it through but it marks his um total decline basically he he starts drinking heavily um starts finding it really hard to find commissions if if you see his last work, so like I said, um, that that there's a twenty twenty year period from uh, Mask of Love, for, uh, and that Him and the Rose, for example, even less than mm. that, 40, 14 years for like ten of his best works, and then um, this is the I think the 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 last great work he did, nineteen thirty four, just before the, the Second World War, um, the Challenge. Um, he, he just stopped producing stuff because he's basically drunk all the time can't he can't even afford the the pigments and no one wants his work but um, he can his his uh, wife his wife and children also leave him during that period as well i mean yeah i mean to totally totally utterly tragic mm -hmm. um so but despite all of that he can still paint and, and again imagine a world where uh duncan was celebrated by the scottish man you know, I think even if he was born like 20 years earlier and doing this kind of work, he would have been like more lauded or whatever, or he could have got he could have gone to London. I, I do feel like him residing in Scotland was like a big negative. I, I don't know. Yeah. I, um, I think if he had gone to London and tried to exhibit at the Royal Academy, he would have done way better and he would have had a successful career. But his but, you know, you can't, maybe you can't do. Can you really do Celtic revivalism? Um, honestly, when you've abandoned your home home country, there's is you know what I'm saying. It's sort of catch twenty two with um, that entire theme. He, um, he's very sincere as well. I think like he wants to revitalise Scotland. He wants to bring back, or he's he, he's trying to bring to the Scottish man true Scottish culture and, and yeah. all the influences on that and elevate the spirit. So it would feel wrong to to go to London to do that. That, that, that's what I'm saying. I, I feel like through his entire life, he is this idealist with a, a this kind of utopian vision, mm. who is just crushed by society. And also, just like I've got to say this, sorry Scottish people, but you're absolutely miserable for for not giving this guy a commission. I'm telling you, if he was in London, he, he would have had commissions, but these tight pursed Scots refused <laughs> to give him the cash he needed, and you know. He en he ended his life, you know. He should have been a national hero, but ended his life just like of like he died of liver failure, basically. So anyway, I don't want to do. He, he too did much get an it. exhibition. He did get an exhibition of his artwork in the the National Gallery, I believe, towards the end of his life. There we go. So there was something. Give it. Give the Scots some credit, Ferry. Yeah. Okay. Always <laughs> after. Always after the artists have died, though. You notice that anyway. No, no, he was alive. He was there. Oh, okay. Oh, there we go. There you go. Um, but yeah, this, this painting in particular is there. Is there anything you wanted to to say about it? I mean, it's it's the challenge. I, I believe it's it's a playoff between um, Odysseus's encounter with the Sphinx, but also I think it's tapping into the there's like an an Assyrian telling, which is mm. of Gilgamesh, which is um, similar. Um, you might need to to, to to verify that for for us. Again, the idea of Odysseus, uh, uh, not Odysseus, Oedipus. Sorry, Oedipus and the Sphinx is a classic symbolist trope. Knopf does it. Moreau does it. Um, several other. Uh, I think Burne Jones maybe uh, did a, did a version of it. Um, and I feel like this is something autobiographical autobiograph uh, about this piece. You've got this figure uh, on the left hand side totally nude um and he's ascend ascended the mountain here and at the top is this mythical creature who's lying in wait wings uh wings up so you can again with the height difference um mm. there's an element of um 
a power imbalance about the kind of nudity and the weakness of man versus this kind of uh, mythological monster. I, I I feel like there's so so much of his anger and hatred about his circumstance has been put into the monster and so much of his weakness and his vulnerability has been placed into the man. You can see, um, I mean, if you were to do the reading of the, the, the kind of Sphinx, you can see the um, the skull next to uh, the creature there um, like a, as, a, as like a little um, s- symbolic warning of um, the power of the Sphinx if you don't ask it, answer, answer his questions right. And again, something similar with the, with the snake. Um, You've got the, um, the the light and the darkness though. Look at the background where the man stands. There is lightness in the in the background, and then the sphinx sits in darkness. There is something kind of almost Nietzschean around this. You know, the man mm-hmm. co- uh, conquering nature, conquering mythology itself. Um, he's climbed to the mountain and will defeat the monster. You know, this, this is your Evolian man. He is doing contraposto, but a really weird version of it. He's sort of like uh, with, with the knee high, highly raised up. I think this has a similar kind of tension to the Tristan and uh, Isolde, but it's a different power dynamic between um, the natural and the unnatural, between uh, a single man and uh, reality itself. And I can't help but just feel, um, you know, just the, like, this is how Duncan felt at the end, and it just feels really tangible and vivid and sad. Um, But... He, he climbed the mountain, and I think that's what you always got to remember with these these tragic lives. Mm-hmm. Is uh, an artist is not, you know, do, doing a painting isn't doesn't make you an artist. I, I I I believe. I think being called an artist is something retroactive that other people call you for a life that is led. You know, it's it's not just um, a moment or an individual work. It is. Um, a pathway or a journey through reality itself and i think this is it like duncan Ch- duncan could have sold out and produced some popular paintings or whatever you know he, he was a good draftsman etc but he was always this idealist that wanted to climb the mountain and um did it as best as he could do despite the gravities of m- crushing modernity i think that's beautifully put um, I think there is an element of hope, though, in this painting. And if you look at his right foot, he's crushing the head of a snake. And okay. for those of you know who their Christian symbolism, yeah, uh, the he's you know he's it's like prophecy. Heel. Yes, yeah, yeah. So and Christ becomes that figure as well. So Christ is depicted as crushing the head of the snake or of Satan, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there is this kind of implication that through. Um, you know, Christ or something like that, you know, victory has been won, even though like that's the fall victory. Um, the victory is yet to be consummated fully. There, there has been a victory already. Um, and the Sphinx will be overturned in that regard. Yeah. I, I didn't know what Duncan's theology was. Um, I... he was a, he was a bit of a theosophist at one point. Okay. Interesting. Um, uh... so he wasn't, but it, it's there's not much to go on beyond that, but he he definitely was tied into theosophism. At, uh, this this is what time. I'm saying about some of those kind of like high Victorian kind of kooky cut. Like I, I put theosophy down as like a, like cultish style mm. um, religious activity that you tend to get in this kind of like godless um, high Victorian period. I I I, I genuinely hope that uh, anyway like some Christian elements uh, remained in him to, to the end. And I, I, again, there's a challenge and, you know, like maybe, maybe there is this kind of optimism in, in the work as well. I just see, I just see the crushing darkness of it, Nathan. That's what, mm. uh, um, that's all. But um, that's, that's all I have to say about John, John yeah. Duncan. And like, I, hopefully we've kind of shown you, I mean, this is by no means his, all his order of some paintings have been lost as well. I, I feel like we could, we could, you can find more, but I think, you know, we're talking about six or seven very significant mm. works, in my opinion, which is which is enough to make him significant as a British artist, let alone as Scotland's greatest artist. Let's start the petition. Let's get him his museum. We know it's going to happen. 
I really hope so. I mean, that should be one of our goals moving forward, for sure. Um, promoting him and just getting him out there uh, would be a massive service to our people, our culture, and so on. So thank you, Faro, for guiding us through uh, some of his uh, greatest hits. Um, I've, I've learned a lot, and I hope that you at home have learned a lot. Do you, do you Are you able to stay for Super Chats, Faro? Of course, of course, yeah. Ah, oh, super. Um, well, we have uh, £2 from Odon D. Thanks for another great stream. Uh, thumbs up. Well, thank you for tuning in and for your very kind donation. Uh, we have uh, $50, very generous, from Josefina. Sorry, I'm going to butcher your last name. Herowege. Herowege. Uh, for your sabbatical. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate that. Um, and uh, another $50, which is very, very kind. Buy some flowers for your lady and do a close reading of a few chapters from the Pickwick Papers. Uh, well, I shall I shall go and do that. Um, uh, and uh, I, yes, I, I shall get some flowers for my lady while I'm away. Don't worry. Um, but yes, thank you. Uh, just say, because some of you might not know, um, this is one of the final streams I'm doing before I take a bit of a break from YouTube. I don't know how long I wait, I'll be away. But I'm hoping in the future to come back in some form or another, even better, with even more passion and knowledge to um, kind of bring topics like this. And we've already mentioned like the pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood. The PRB stream. Look, we've yeah. said it now. We've got the t PRB stream. We've got the Tennyson stream. It has to happen. I but, will but... hunt you down, Nathan. I'll find you in real life and I'll drag you to my house and force you to do the stream no matter what you're doing. <laughs> There's no escape. <laughs> It's like the challenge. It's coming at some point. Exactly. Uh, I, I am the Sphinx monster, Nathan. I'll just appear out of nowhere mm -hmm. and steal you like St. Bride. I don't know how I feel about this, but uh, much much appreciated, Farrow. Um, thank you again for, for uh, tuning in, and thank you, Farrow, for joining. It's been a real pleasure to have you on again. My, my pleasure. And I just wanted to thank thanks for the chat. It's been entertaining, kind of mm. seeing people's reactions, and uh, yeah, appreciate it. Just want to say, just want to do a little plug before we finish. Um, for those who don't know, I'm I'm helping run an art exhibition. I'm actually inside that art exhibition. It's literally in one month's time in London. We've hired a space in central London. We're 10 minutes away from the BBC. Can you believe it? Um, we've got Alexander Adams. We've got uh, Fender Villiers, if you've seen some of his work before. Um, he does sculptures, right? He does, yeah, he does got sculptures. Exact, exactly. Um if if you go to, I'll get Nathan to put this in the um, mm -hmm. in the show notes. Uh, the exhibition.co.uk. You can read a little bit more about it. Sign up to our email address, uh, to our newsletter, and you'll find find all about it. But this is it's the most significant cultural moment of the decade. Is how we're talking about it. It's this is our anti academic. Um, we, we, we are the PRB taking down the stuffy academy. So um, please, it's, it's going to be live in, in July. Come down. It's going to be amazing. If you can't make it, if you're, if you're America, si sign up. We're going to be selling various bits and bobs, original artworks, etc. So make sure you, can, mm. you sign up to, uh, to, to take a look. So, Will we be able to meet some of the artists in person? Well, depends... It depends, Nathan. We'll, we'll we'll see. Okay. If if you've got the the wallet that's ready, I, we can make it. We can make it happen. I could, you know, if you come to me and say you're you're willing to commission a fifty thousand uh, pound sculpture from Fender Villiers, I can I can get you to meet Fen. Great. I'll do some saving up. <laughs> you've got a month. You've got a month. I might. I should do some more streams then. I think. Um... Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but no, that down. sounds great and i've put i've put the uh the link in the chat and i'll put it in the show notes afterwards and everybody should support this because you know we're constantly talking about doing things in real life things that matter for our culture reconnecting people with you know good art beautiful things true things this is an example of that so please do go and support it um and i'm sure it's going to be a great exhibition uh if you don't already follow some of these guys you could Go and do that because you can see some of what they're already doing. Um, but yeah, definitely go. I'm going to try and go if I can. Um, it's a bit. It's a bit dependent on work deadlines, but if I can get them in, I'll see you there. Excellent. Well, thank you everybody uh, for tuning in. 
go and discover more about John Duncan. Until next time, God bless you, whoever you are, wherever you are. Good night.